Thank you. Right. So uh, before we uh, move ahead, I'd like to just mention that there'll be a slight revision to the agenda tonight. And that is that we're going to reverse the order of the two uh, information items that we're dealing with. So that uh, we'll start out with the information item on with an overview of Denver Regional Council of Governments information. And then we'll uh, move to the ADU uh, update information. So just wanted to uh, make that clear for all of our participants. Um, and the other uh, point I wanted to make before uh, moving into consideration of the minutes is that we have a public participation section following our consideration of minutes. And because we have no public hearings tonight, uh, everything is, uh, you can talk about whatever you like in the public participation section. Normally, when there's a public hearing, we ask people to, to have their comments on those topics in the public hearing section themselves. But because we have no public hearing tonight, you can talk about whatever you please in the public participation section. And uh, we'll uh, ask you to limit your comments to three minutes uh, uh, each. And uh, I think Vivian will probably manage that section for us. But first, uh, let's, con let's deal with the minutes from December 6th, which have been distributed. And I know that there's been a response by, uh, uh, with some edits by at least one member of the board. Uh, so uh, I hope you've all had a chance to see that. And I would entertain a motion to approve of those minutes, if you agree with them. I'll make a motion. Okay, do we have a second? I will second. Very good, all in favor, raise your hand. George, uh, you you weren't there for the meeting. I wasn't there, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, it looks like the minutes are approved. Thank you. And now we'll move ahead to the public participation section of this meeting. So uh, Vivian, take over. Thank you, John. So um, the way this will work is we ask the public who's here to raise their hand if they'd like us to call on them. And we will have a timer of three minutes um, and we already have a few hands, so I will just go down the list. Um, Devin, if you could get the timer ready, please, that would be great. So we'll start with uh, Megan Coles, followed by Lisa Spalding. Uh, Megan, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Macon Coles, 1726 Mapleton. I want to talk to you about one aspect of the ADU changes that you're considering, which is flexibility for height. And that makes a lot of people very, very nervous when they hear about that. So I want to give you a good real life example. Our uh, friends and neighbors across the street um, on 17th and Mapleton had a historic have a historic house and a historic um, outbuilding on the alley. They wanted to make a studio of it, and eventually an ADU when the regulations changed in 2019. They actually got the design through landmarks, approving this design for a changed and renovated. Um, studio on the alley of their historic house. When they went to build a or pull a building permit, the planning department said, you're three inches into the alley. The shed that they were renovating to make a studio was actually built in 1870. And so they pulled the design, they had to lift the building up and bring it forward. Um, since they're moving at three inches, the planning department made them move it three feet. Well, then the building was too high. The studio was too high. So they actually had to build a hole to lower the whole thing in order to come within the current height restriction for 
um, accessory dwellings. That cost them $32,000 to dig a hole, um, raise the building, and pour a new foundation. So providing flexibility for height modifications really is an important aspect of enabling ADUs. And I just wanted to tell you about that so you would understand maybe some of the context and reason why that perhaps should be considered. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your service. We really appreciate you and appreciate your service. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Lisa Balding, followed by Amy Haywood. Um, Lisa, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Lisa Spaulding, I'm representing the University Hill Neighborhood Association. We sent you a letter that we had sent to the city council. Um, due to the current impacts from a high population density on the hill, we oppose the one size fits all approach of the proposed ADU changes that eliminate saturation limits for neighborhoods of vastly different needs, desires, and caring capacities, especially those neighborhoods surrounding the university. The assertion that no other city in the country has saturation limits has become a rallying cry for deregulation, but three of the five zones in Chicago that allow ADUs have an annual limit of two per block. This allows the city to judge the effects of a gradual population increase. A Utah law, law allows ADUs in any residential zone statewide and stipulates that cities may not regulate or restrict them. However, this law also allows cities to prohibit ADUs in a percentage of their residential areas, which ranges from 25% in most cities to 67% in cities with large universities. Provo, home to Brigham Young University and comparable in population to Boulder, passed a code change that permitted the exemption of up to 67% of its residential areas. There are other examples of cities with saturation limits, but many cities use other tools to guard against as adverse impacts on neighborhoods, like special permits <clears throat> that include a public hearing. Dallas requires a special exception to single family regulations adjudicated at a public hearing before the Board of Adjustments. The board may not consider how the appeal may benefit the applicant and can grant the exception only if it will not adversely affect neighboring property. The saturation limit is the only tool Boulder has that prevents adverse effects that could overwhelm our already dense neighborhood. In the 1970s, medium density blocks of the hill south of College and west of 16th were down zoned to low density in an effort to ensure a balance between family homes and student rentals. Unfortunately, the city grandfathered everything in without a sunset date. Non-conforming uses count toward the ADU saturation limit and the large number of legal non-conforming properties on the hill already places a huge strain on many blocks. For example, the 800 block of 11th street has a sorority with an occupancy of 109, a triplex across the street from it with nine legal residents and the soon to be completed high end student apartment complex, formerly Marfa House, across the alley from the sorority, which will have an occupancy of 48. We do not object to ADUs, but share concerns about the proposed changes with other neighborhoods surrounding the university and hope to discuss alternatives to the one size fits all approach with staff before a final draft ordinance is written. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next up, we have Amy Haywood, followed by Brent Groman, together with Amanda Tanner. Amy, you have three minutes. Thank you. I'm Amy Haywood, 2075 Upland Avenue. We, um, I completely support making ADUs an option for all single family homes in Boulder that have a lot size that will sustain it or that want to share their house. We have a housing crisis. ADUs are an amazingly simple way to integrate and improve socioeconomic diversity, secure aging in space, create community, supplement income for those who need it, and provide more affordable housing. They're doing amazing things in other states. They've, in Vermont, it's they passed a law that allows 
um, equal treatment of housing and town bylaws require municipalities to allow all homeowners to add one ADU to their house as permitted use as long as it they meet certain requirements, and I'm not exactly sure what they are. In New Hampshire, they pass the same law. In Washington State, you can have one to two ADUs if you have a large lot over 5,000 square feet um, and up. So it's pretty amazing that other communities are not falling apart because they've loosened ADU requirements. I live on Upland Avenue and our house backs up to Vine Avenue where developers are building 4,000 plus square foot homes, single family homes, um, and one next door just rented for $10,000 per month or more. I'm not exactly sure, but I know that it's in that range. I can't even imagine spending $10,000 per month for rent. Um, further down Vine, um, Rob Nauman was granted permission by the city council to build ADUs and a home on every one of his lots, but they are building instead uh, Vine Estates, which are large, expensive luxury homes, and there's a lot of advertising out about that. Um, I don't think that there'll be a rush to go crazy building ADUs in Boulder. I wish that there would be, but most two person single family households in Boulder do not wanna share their home or their yard or their bathroom. ADUs require an effort, effort to build, a sacrifice of privacy and giving up space in your home or yard. It's just not appealing to most Boulderites. So I encourage you to make it easier for the average person to have an ADU or two on their property if they're willing to share. I see three car garages and just can't believe that we provide housing for cars, but not for people. So please equal the playing field. If people want a big house and three car garage, that's fine. But if people want a yard and I mean, if they wanna have share a portion of their property and have another person living there, please allow that. Thank you very much. It's a very important topic. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for showing up and, and providing your input. Um, next, we'll hear from Brent Grumman with Amanda Tanner, followed by Jesse um, Cuman. Please go ahead, Brent. Hi, this is Brent Grumman uh, with my wife, Amanda Tanner. Hi. <laughs> we live at 927 Pine Street. And the reason we're joining today is because we have an existing structure that is consists of a garage and there's like an overhead uh, loft area. And we wanted to, when the regulations passed in 2019, we wanted to um, go forward with this structure and convert it into a full rentable unit. And when we went through that process, we came to discover because we live on the side of Mapleton Hill, and additionally, because Boulder requires uh, the height of a structure to be measured from the lowest point within 25 feet of that structure, when we go from the alley side at 16 feet and then go down the slope, we end up in a situation where now the height of the building exceeds the 25 foot limit allowed for with the ADU regulations. And so we have no remedy, even though this is, is about as close to an existing ADU as you could have. Um, just in structure and physically. So the only option we were left with would be to actually build something in the yard. Of course, that's superfluous. It uses additional resources and creates more impervious area, all of which I believe are contrary to the city's goals with respect to sustainability. So therefore, a change in this ordinance to allow for uh, grandfathering of existing structures would be very beneficial to us in order to be able to have a rentable unit and add to the housing supply. And with that, I'll yield back the, the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, okay, next up we have Jesse followed by Kurt Nordbeck. Jesse, please go ahead, you have three minutes.
Jesse, are you with us? I see that uh, Jesse seems to be muted. So I've, I've given her permission to speak. I think she has to unmute herself from her side. Um, but we can go to the, why don't we go to Kurt and we can come back to Jesse. Um, Seven, if you can start the timer over. Um, Kurt, please go ahead. Hi, Kurt Nordbeck, 777 Delwood Avenue. I sent you an email, which hopefully you received. I'm just urging you to endorse the HAB recommendations, uh, which are in your memo. Uh, HAB spent a lot of time, a lot, multiple mess, uh, meetings, and a lot of public input time, a lot of public engagement, thinking about ADUs uh, over the course of the fall, and came up with a uh, an extensive suite of proposed changes that they felt were balanced, that sort of um, covered a, a wide range of current impediments and, and allowed in a measured way for additional ADUs with you know, proper constraints. And so that's that suite of, of changes that is in your memo. And unfortunately, um, staff did not endorse all of those and then the council uh, restricted the scope of the project to what staff endorsed is my understanding. But I would like, I, I would just urge you to recommend that council include the full suite of HAB recommendations. In particular, there were two that were left off. One, removing the parking requirement, which, you know, we all know that we need to move away from parking requirements anyhow. And this would be a tiny step in that direction. And the other one is removing this strange minimum lot size requirement. Both of those code wise, both of those are extremely simple. It's just would be a matter of removing existing code. Literally in Microsoft Word, it would be one minute of <laughs> removing code. So it's really not a complex thing. So uh, I would just urge you to recommend to council that those be reincorporated as part of this project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, let's try Jesse again. Jesse, um, you just have to unmute yourself from your end and you should be able to speak. Wait a couple seconds. Okay, is that good? Yeah, we can hear you. Please oh. go ahead. Okay, um, so I, I wanted to have you, if you will, take a look at PUDs as part of the solution um, because uh, there are a lot of older uh, parts of Boulder where uh, they were developed using planned unit developments and uh, they're frozen in time. So um, I, I, I sent a little note, I'll just read from the note. PUDs also stand in the way of change. Please consider dissolving old PUDs as part of removing obstruction to ADUs. The PUD we live in has three conforming houses on low density lots and nine non conforming medium density houses on low density lots. They're all frozen in time. There are 12 houses in the PUD. They're frozen in time, you can't really alter them. Three of them conform and are, are large lots. They're, they're 9,300 square feet or larger that we can't alter the footprint on. And they've been frozen since the 1980s. Um, so I think that first, before you can solve a problem, you have to define what the problem is and you should take a look around the city and see how many PUDs are, are frozen in time and how many lots in those PUDs can, can uh, actually be freed up to use for ADUs. So uh, we, we happen to own two lots like that, that we would love to be able to do things to that have been frozen in time and, and the city won't alter them. It's like, you know, someone, had had written 
in something into the Bible that shouldn't be changed. Um, and, and I think that every 40 years, you should be able to look at zoning and say, well, maybe we should alter it so that people can update their houses and, and be able to actually do things that would conform with their existing low density zoning um, that we can't do now because the city has frozen PUDs. So uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer it. We've got a 9,800 square foot lot with a 1,200 square foot house and one bathroom, and we can't do anything with it. You can't put an ADU on that. So you can keep things frozen in time. You can't alter them. You have to look at everything. That's pretty much it. Thanks so much. Thanks for sticking within the time. Um, next, we have Emily Reynolds, followed by Dorothy Cohen. Uh, Emily, just appreciate if you can watch the timer and please go ahead. Thanks. Hello, Planning Board. Emily Reynolds, 2030 Mesa Drive, Boulder, Colorado. Like many people you represent, I'm terribly upset at the prospect of three buildings per lot in our beautiful established neighborhoods. City officials have promoted so much development. The Heat Island at 30th and Google is but one example of the aggressive development. Out of state developments, uh, developers and local ADU developers like ML Robles will be pleased if you allow this. They will be able to fill their giant coffers further. Board member ML Robles has a clear and obvious conflict of interest and should not be permitted to vote on this. Planning board cannot be oblivious to this. Robles has no business voting on this issue. There are others in the immediate vicinity, but the ADU next door to me, affectionately called the Alley Turd, blocks my views to the west. No sunsets, no view of the weather coming in, no mountain views, and offers two by four foot area of afternoon sunshine in one of Boulder's earliest solar homes. You may have seen my before and after pics in, in an email today. A lovely sunset versus a semi truck sized black plane. When the alley turd was under construction, a worker asked me if he could work from my side because he couldn't open his ladder in the three feet between the building and the fence on his side. Destroying the integrity of our established neighborhoods is not the route to affordable housing. I wish the city would do more with affordable housing, but this simply will cause prices to go up. The only way it would work is if an in if an individual having just finished a construction project chose to rent at a below market rate. This is seriously unlikely unless you make it a requirement. Any AD news should be required to meet affordability housing requirements. Otherwise, you're simply adding more expensive housing to Boulder. Another suggestion would be to enforce the laws and regulations. My neighbor has countless illegal acts to his name and has seen zero consequences, with the exception of the cha-ching part. Owners are supposed to live on the property. Ha! He lives in Pennsylvania. He lied to neighbors about building a 10 by 12 foot shed and so on and on. Jamming more and more people into Boulder is a nightmare for those of us who are long-term residents. Please moderate this extreme stance. You've loosened regs for ADUs twice in the last few years. All this will do is increase density and housing costs. Please consider carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for sharing your views with us. Um, next up is Dorothy Cohen. And I just want to remind uh, participants here tonight to please go ahead and raise your hand if you uh, plan to, to, to speak up tonight so we can see how many people we have remaining. Dorothy, please go ahead. My name is Dorothy Cohen. I live in Martin Acres at 2845 Elm Avenue. And I'm horrified about some of the ADUs that people are putting in. It's supposed to be affordable housing. 
and some of them I've heard are bigger than my house. My house is less than 800 square feet. And I've heard people are putting uh, ADUs that are over 900 square feet. It just doesn't make sense. And some of them are above the low income housing. They're charging rents that are exorbitant. So where do we, where do we come out ahead? What, what are we gaining? What this other woman said, it's like, if you don't, if you have an ADU and you're charging rents that are ex exorbitant, it makes no sense. And I've heard of people that are living in the ADUs and renting out their house. So how are they coming out ahead? I mean, there's just, there's too many questions. There are too many, I've seen pictures of ADUs that are what that lady was talking about that are close to the fence. And don't we have a sunshine law that you can't uh, block, if somebody wants to do solar, you can't block it. So how are the, if, if these ADUs are blocking somebody's uh, view of the sunset, what are we come? How are we coming out ahead? And if these, if the cost of these units is more than affordable housing, what have we gained from the whole system? I mean, I think we need to have better housing, but I don't think. I think that there has to be some better regulations and better. Uh, uh, control of what's going on. Two ADUs on one property make no sense at all. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, next up, and the, this is the last hand remaining, so just encourage others to raise your hand if you intend to speak. Um, Fran Sheets, please go ahead. Fran, you need to unmute yourself from your end. Um, let's give Fran a couple of seconds to figure that out. And otherwise there are no other hands raised. Unmute. Hi, I'm sorry. I was doing other stuff. And I, um, my name is Fran Sheets, and I live at Fifth and Marine in Boulder. I've lived in Boulder for nearly 49 years, and my husband's family has lived here continuously for over 100 years. And now many people in Boulder today, people know Boulder's history and what it was like to live here and why the decisive decisions were made that made this place somewhat unique and a very desirable uh, town. We watched Boulder change directions over time and from a city concerned with livability and quality of life, we were now facing a history of our, our own inequities from redlining and racism. And now the current concerns with climate crisis and, and housing, but the quality of life is no longer on that list and it should be. We, we can do and we can provide housing and we can maintain a quality of life if it's done thoughtfully, but not by building randomly and packing in as many people as possible or making the disparities wider. To this point, the trajectory of the city in the past was set historically by a series of insightful citizens. John can tell you about this. The overall goal was to create an environment for ourselves and our children that was safe, aesthetically pleasing, and where people could flourish. We did have a process for building affordable and subsidized housing, and it worked. We also maintained our smaller houses, which we are not doing right now. We're taking them down and putting up big houses in, in, in exchange. We did more than the surrounding cities as well. From times past, Boulder implemented the, the blue line, a green belt, the height limit, bike paths, sidewalks, subsidized housing, and, and zoning regulations. And like it or not, all these issues define the city. The trajectory of creative thinking in the past did not come from city staff of urban planners, but from active, unusually hardworking citizens through petitions, the ballot box, and just hard work. Boulder became known as a thoughtful and unique city 
because they were highly educated people who were able to imagine and implement change in unusual ways that still met the needs of people. Maybe Boulder became somewhat unique because we had high expectations for a lot of creative out of the box imagining for the city and its future and we need to do that now this proposal to put three houses on a lot makes no sense. Um, maybe with the changing times, the pressures facing the city and the whole country for that matter, thinking of our classist and racist past, we changed course. But the idea of building multiple ADUs in our backyards completes the leap into an inequitable, unsustainable city. Rather than creative solutions, we'll continue the course of overcrowding with people in cars and unsafe, unhealthy environments and not enough parks and play areas for kids and adults and the wealthy get even wealthier. So this proposal trashes our zoning in, and in one way, it's a one way permanent street into expensive housing and more wealth for the wealthy landowning. It will move Boulder into the category of being like all other cities with rising crime, too many cars, people, not enough space. It puts us squarely on the unsustainable path, lacking imagination and reasonable solutions. It's failed in other communities and it will fail us here too. Thank you guys. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so there are no other hands raised for the open comment, John. You're on mute. You're on mute, John. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll bring the public comment uh, portion of this meeting to an end. Uh, and we'll move ahead. We don't have any uh, call ups to consider, and there are no public hearing items on tonight's agenda. What we do have are two significant information items to consider. And uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we'll start out uh, reversing what's shown on the agenda and we'll move ahead with an overview of the Denver Regional Council of Governments uh, uh, as an information item. Um, and I think that's Nicole Spear who is going to be presenting that to us tonight. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm just wondering, Devin, if you would be able to pull up my slides or if you'd prefer that I do them. Happy. Yep, I can get them for you. Okay, well, thank you. I'll just tell you when it's time to move um, move on to the next one. Uh, so thank you very much, um, Planning Board, for having me here tonight. Um, I'll just state for the public, uh, this is Nicole Spear from City Council. And um, I am coming to you tonight as our council's representative and director on the Denver Regional Council of Governments, otherwise known as Dr. Cog. Um, so thank you again for giving me time to share these updates with you all. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank Jean Sanson and our transportation department for putting these slides together and to Jean and Natalie Stifler and all of our incredible transportation staff for getting me up to speed on some of these regional transportation issues over the past year. Um, as you all know, but I'll state for any members of the public on the meeting, Dr. Cog is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. It's basically our regional planning organization whose directors are council members and county commissioners from across the Denver metro area. The board of directors works with Dr. Cog's staff to establish guidelines, set policy, and allocate funding for transportation and personal mobility, regional growth and development, and aging and disability resources. Um, all right, on to the next slide, please. So some of you remem may remember that in 2021, Senate Bill 21260 established some greenhouse gas reduction targets for state and regional transportation plans. What this meant for the Denver metro region is that we were required to come up with a plan to reduce surface transportation greenhouse gas emissions through our Dr. Cog transportation planning process. So this past year in 2022, Dr. Cog spent a lot of time working on changes to our region's transportation plan. It's called the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan or the 2050 RTP. The changes not only included updates to the 2050 RTP, they also committed our region to further action through a mitigation action plan. And the Dr. Cog board adopted the 2050 RTP and mitigation action plan in September 2022. Next slide, please. 
The changes to the 2050 RTP resulted in some pretty major shifts in how we plan transportation across the region. We're planning to meet almost 90% of our greenhouse gas reduction targets just by changing how we spend transportation dollars. So rather than spending billions of dollars on highway expansions, we'll be investing instead in building the multimodal infrastructure that we need for more transit, biking, and walking. So in the coming decades, we'll start seeing changes like removing several highway, highway widening projects like along the I-25 um, Central Corridor and C-470, expediting bus rapid transit corridors like our Colorado 119 bus rapid transit project, adding another $900 million for multimodal projects, and adding investments in pedestrian, bicycle, safety, um, transit, complete streets, and so on. So these changes, along with some changed assumptions about how many in our how many people in our region are going to be teleworking now that we're more used to working remotely, um, weren't quite enough to get us to our goals. So we'll accomplish the remaining 11% of our reductions through voluntary for now changes to our land use and parking management strategies. So let me first um, show you what some of these strategies are, and then I'll say a little bit more. Sorry, my times are about to go. Um, but I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by voluntary for now. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Dr. Cog identified several mitigation strategies that are going to make a big difference in our region's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, things like increasing residential density, increasing job density, having more mixed use transit oriented development, reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements and adopting local complete street standards. And you can see the anticipated annual reductions under each of the icons in the slide. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report lists increasing density as critical for saving the planet. And you can read more in the latest report about how increasing housing and job density is a key transition that will help the planet avoid more than 1.5 degrees of global warming. Dr. Cog is going to be providing technical assistance to communities that are all, that are ready to work on these mitigation strategies in the coming years. And as usual, Boulder is out ahead on climate, and our new East Boulder subcommunity plan actually meets a lot of these requirements already. So I'll share more on that in just a moment. But I want to get back to what I mean by voluntary for now. So the region has some check-in points on how we're doing on our greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. The first one is going to come up in four years. If we're not on target, additional mitigation strategies will likely come into effect, which will start tying transportation funding to this mitigation action plan. What that means is that to be competitive for transportation funding, we would have to show that we're making progress on these changes. In this current funding cycle, we've had over $47 million come in through Dr. Cog for transportation projects. So it really matters for a city that we stay competitive for this funding. Transportation staff and I are all a little doubtful that the 2050 RTP and the mitigation action plan are sufficient to get us to our goals by the um, first checkpoint in four years. So these more stringent regulations on funding um, we think are likely to kick in. Next slide, please. But like I said, the good news is that we're already coming out ahead. Um, you may remember that our East Boulder subcommunity plan addressed this issue directly, and we're anticipating a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions due to increasing the number of people who make trips closer to home and work. So by creating a well-connected, walkable, and bike-friendly transportation system paired with these 15-minute neighborhoods, we can not only improve mobility and quality of life, we can meaningfully move the needle on our broader climate goals. Our East Boulder subcommunity plan addresses three of the eight mitigation action plan strategies that Dr. Cog created. So keeping up with the Senate Bill 21, uh, 260 greenhouse gas emissions reductions really just means doing more of the work that we're already doing. That's the end of the first part of this presentation about the 2050 RTP and the mitigation action plan. Um, does anybody have questions? Um, I do. Mm -hmm. So Cole, thank you. Um, very interesting, but what's built into this is the assumption that people will, by definition, live near where their job is. And I'm sort of curious um, how, which is not necessarily true. <laughs> so I'm curious um, how you all, how the plan accommodates that reality. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think they they were working on the modeling for um, quite some time, and I think I'd have to go back to look at the specifics of how they did that part of it. Um, but what the staff were, were trying to take into account was um, kind of how how far people are commuting for their jobs, where their jobs are, um, and then the, the number of people who are um, teleworking and who may be increasing their, their teleworking as well. So I know that doesn't totally answer your question, Sarah, um, but I can I can go back and look more in detail at the um, at the the math that they were doing in, in making these projections. I appreciate it. Um, we'll have and I don't want to make you do more work than you already have to do on on City Council. We can ask the transportation staff when next they present to us. Sure. Somebody. Yeah. No, I don't mind asking. I'll pass that question on um, if I if I can't find it quickly myself. Lisa. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of piggyback off what um, Sarah just asked, and I'd be interested in one kind of like what went into the modeling, and then also if there are similar analogs where we can look back and see like, oh, we 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 put these assumptions in in either similar neighborhoods in the metro area, ideally, or in like a comparable city, um, you know, and then we actually saw that borne out in like you know trip studies that we performed, because um, I think that's the piece that I'm always curious about, whether it's TDM or you know, G GHG plan or anything is is that we we do our best, you know, we model, we look at it. And then I'm always curious, you know, if we come back and look at that in six months, two years, five years, what do we see? Um, because I think that if we could say, okay, these are fairly analogous examples or other examples in a neighborhood in the metro area. And yes, it did indeed bear out in that way, then I, I would have more confidence in it. Um, so yeah, I, I'd be interested in that, not just the, in, the inputs, but any um, you know, post-mortem analysis of, of how it actually turned out. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, our first checkpoint is going to be in four years. Um, so I think that'll that'll kind of be when it's coming up. But um, I think we will be hearing some updates before then. So I don't think they're going to wait four years <laughs> to tell us if things are way off track. And um, I think, you know, some of, some of why uh, we were a little bit cautious about thinking that we may get to, um, that we may meet the 2050 RTP goals um, is because of some of the assumptions that were made about how people were going to be moving and commuting around our region. Um, I think that's why why our transportation staff and I were a little little wary of that and why we think it, it may be more likely for this, the mitigation action plan um, stuff to kick in. But um, I will go back and, and find that find that part of the report and make sure that you all have that. Okay, I think we can move to your next section then. Thank you. Uh, so next slide, please. This is just shifting topics to talk a little bit about um, RTD so that you all are aware of some transit updates. Um, so as you all will know, we had quite a few RTD service cuts during the pandemic. Um, RTD has been trying to get back as fast as they can, but workforce challenges and budget shortages have really impacted the restoration of services. So RTD is expecting significantly reduced services through 2027. Um, right now, there's a lot of uncertainty around when services are going to be coming back. Um, what they're trying to work to is getting us to 80% of pre-COVID service levels for routes that are serving Boulder. Um, so one example of these service, do you want me to pause? No, I just have a question about this that maybe you can fold into what you're talking about, which is mm -hmm. um, whether RTD and the city have determined where the people who live in um, Transit Village are going to either, are they taking public transit by going somewhere else? I mean, going up to whatever, some other bus stop, or are they dry? Like, what do we know about the, cons the impacts of these shortages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I will ask that question to our transportation staff. I have not seen those data presented um, either at Dr. Cog or through any uh, meetings with RTD, but I can ask if anybody has that information. Lisa. Mm, forgive me, it's possible that um, a baby was in my ear at this point, and this is um, a somewhat inflammatory question, but I was thinking about it earlier today. Um, I think it was actually a, some, someone wrote in with a comment, I think, um, on ADUs, and, and, but the, toward the end, there was something I thought was really interesting. It was talking about free bus routes in Missoula. Um, 
and I just keep coming back to if RTD can't provide it in the city, and I realize we still maybe have a relationship with fodder and fire, leave the district, which I know is terrible for equity and terrible for other people. And why don't we take the same money and fund free transit throughout Boulder? Everybody gets an eco pass or whatever the equivalent is without having to run through the RTD ecos. But I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know where council's at on this. I don't know where our reps are at on this. I know it's a regional issue, but I personally am so frustrated with our relationship with them. And I, I don't know. I, I, I hope that conversations around that are happening and that they're meaningful and not just like, I, I, I'd be curious to know if meaningful conversations around that are happening, I guess would be my question. Yes. Um, you know, or is it just something that people yell about when they're mad? Like I get mad. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's actually my next slide. Um, so, but I, th I think I got everything there. Sorry, so, sorry, yeah, Nicole. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's okay, Lisa. It was a great, great segue into the next slide. Uh, oh, but before just, the, just, before, sorry, yeah. Before you yeah. move away, uh -huh. I was just wondering, what is the obligation of RTD to operate the Transit Center Depot under all the arrangements under which that was uh, planned and built in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that remains unclear to me. I, I'd be interested to know more about that. Yeah, as far as I can tell, there is no obligation there. So I will I will confirm that. Um, but I do not believe that there, there is an obligation there. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. And I may be I may be completely speaking and not not knowing, but um in a, any of the conversations that I have had, nothing about that has ever been raised. writing that question down so I remember it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, but, the, you know, we, we are looking to get a couple of routes back um, in the next five years, but the timing on when those will come back is very uncertain. Um, okay, so we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, right now there are some plans in the works to figure out a path forward, given there's some uncertainty about when some of these services will be re restored. And there are a few things that are being created. Um, and this actually was the presentation from a couple months ago. So um, closer to closer to being created now. Um, a sub-regional service council is going to be advising RTD on service changes and our city staff will be participating in that process. There will be a partnership program that is going to be implementing pilot programs and cost share programs like the HOP um, that's currently funded by CU Boulder and RTD. And at the, the Dr. Cog sub, Dr. Cog sub regional forum, which is basically um, the Dr. Cog directors from within the county and from the cities, uh, local city governments from within um, Boulder County, we're going to be working together on starting a countywide strategic transit plan to think about what we're moving towards. So kind of getting to your point, Lisa, is, you know, if, if we're, um, where, where, where are we headed? What are we trying to do with our transportation? Um, and what does that look like as we move forward? The forum is going to be made up of a county commissioner and then county um, staff and city council members and our transportation staff, as well as transportation staff from cities across Boulder County. Um, so that's just a, a little update um, on some of the RTD plans and where, where we're headed as a sub-regional forum within Dr. Cog to think about transportation in our region, uh, in our sub-region as we move forward. Can you just tell us what's included in our sub-region? Who's included in our sub-region? Yep, so um, it's basically uh, everybody in Boulder County, so Longmont, Superior, um, Erie, uh, Louisville, Lafayette, and then um, somebody from the county, the county commissioner's office. Those are, I think I've got everybody there. So that kind of goes to Lisa's point. <laughs> that uh you know if we have if we have that conversation going you know at the risk of um you know being revolutionary we could conceivably just set up our own system that solves that solves addresses some of these transportation issues because it's going to be a couple of years before East Boulder sub community plan all the underlying stuff is actually completed before folks start building if they start, you know, it depends on what happens to the economy. Um, and obviously it's gonna be till 2027, according to your documents before anything happens to improve RTD 
that's a and and then there's this four year check in which falls right in the middle of that. Um, so maybe this uh, sub regional council is the best most uh, likely um, forum for moving forward more quickly. Yeah, I think we'll have some really good conversations coming out of there and just trying to understand, you know, given given the transit needs of our region, what are how do we move forward? Okay. Happy to come back and give more updates anytime. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Was are there any additional questions for Nicole? All right. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll move ahead to our our next uh, item tonight, which is an uh, information item uh, and hopefully a discussion uh, of of the access accessory dwelling unit up, uh, updates. And this is uh, an information. Uh, session but uh, and we won't be taking any formal decisions tonight but staff uh, views this as an opportunity to present the latest and greatest of what has been uh, accomplished and uh, staff consideration of staff's recommendations um, and we hope that there will be a coherent and useful discussion that staff can take back and uh, use in their refinement of a material which will be dealt with in a in a public hearing by planning board and city council probably later in February or in March sometime. Uh, and Lisa uh, has been running this show and uh, please take it away, uh, Lisa. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the great introduction. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. John, I'm sorry. Just John, do you want to explain how we're? Oh. Yeah, I, I should do that. So Lisa has identified several questions for us to consider explicitly. Uh, and we'll have a, a discussion, uh, questions and a discussion after each of those items. Uh, and then sub at the end, we'll be able to raise any issues and questions uh, dealing that we feel have not been adequately addressed in the individual discussions of each of those four uh, items. Um, and uh, Lisa will be presenting those. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion after each each of those presentations. Perfect. So I hope that clarifies. The, thank you, Sarah. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Go ahead, Lisa. All right, thanks. I am really looking forward to this discussion about accessory dwelling units or you'll hear the acronym ADUs used a lot because accessory dwelling units is a mouthful. <laughs> um, but tonight we're gonna talk about the evaluation report that was done last year, kind of look back at the last few years of ADUs, talk about the comparable cities research that we've been doing, and then we'll dive into the focus areas for the update that we're planning to do this year. So starting off with the super basics, which some of you might know, but I just wanted to, to level set there. Um, what is an ADU? So in Boulder, we have both an attached ADU and a detached ADU. So you can see on the right-hand side, those top two images, the blue is the ADU. So an attached ADU can either be like an upstairs unit or a basement unit, um, but it's always a small residence that's sharing the lot with the main house. So that's the important part of what an ADU is. It can also be a detached ADU, which, mean, which is that bottom image, which is in a separate structure, but still on the same lot. And the important thing is it's an independent self-contained housing unit. So it has a kitchen and a bathroom and it provides an additional housing option often in places where um, single family zoning would typically only allow one unit. This project was um, brought to us by city council uh, in their retreat last year. They identified updates to the ADU regulations as one of their work program priorities for 2022 and 2023 with the main objective being to increase the allowance of ADUs in Boulder. Specifically, they asked staff to look at removing the saturation limit, which we'll get into much more detail about tonight, and also looking at allowing both an attached and a detached 
ADU on a lot. So right now you're only allowed to have one ADU. So they wanted us to look at having multiple ADUs on the lot. Council also directed us to analyze potential barriers that exist in our codes to ADU construction. And so that's where we uh, did, completed an evaluation of the most recent co um, comprehensive update that's been made to the ADU regulations. It was adopted in late 2018 and went into effect in early 2019. So that's what we were working on um, kind of starting in the last, last summer. Um, but a ton of data analysis, which, which I'll go over tonight, as well as interviewing internal um, staff who works on ADUs. So licensing staff, planning staff, all the people that touch an ADU permit, we talked to them about um, the issues with process and things like that. We also worked with our housing and human services staff to do a survey of all of the ADU owners in the city. And then we also interviewed even applicants who had started the process for an ADU but chose to withdraw to try to understand uh, what barriers there that might have been in place that caused them to withdraw. So that was the initial direction that was given by Council early last year. As was mentioned by one of our commenters, the Housing Advisory Board has been discussing ADUs over the last several years. And so when this was put on the work program priority, they list, they, um, they, excuse me, wanted to provide a recommendation to council on what the scope of work should be. So the Housing Advisory Board um, put a recommendation forward to council that this the, these ADU changes should, should focus on um, kind of a different scope of work than what that initial direction had been. So eliminating the saturation limit, that was the same, but also eliminating the parking requirements for ADUs, eliminating the minimum lot size requirement for ADUs, revising the ADU size limits, and some more procedural things like creating pre-approved ADU floor plans that people could use and streamlining the ADU review process. So in November, uh, just a couple months ago, we went back to city council to refine the scope of the project uh, to determine what scope they wanted staff to move forward with. And what staff recommended based on the results of the evaluation report was limiting it to four main items. So the first being eliminating the, the ADU saturation limit or exploring the elimination of that. The second being modifying the size limits as HAB had recommended us looking at. And we had seen, and I'll talk about a bit about that, what we saw in the evaluation. And then the final two are more general, just clarifying and simplifying the regulations. Some of these main sticking points that we went through that kept coming up through the evaluation process as barriers to ADU construction that, um, you know, we could get kind of the most bang for our buck in making some, some minor changes to the code that could really improve the clarity. Um, and then overall, just some rewriting and simplifying and things like that. And then aside from code changes, there's also a number of procedural improvements that we could, could make that I'll go through tonight as well. So that's the direction that we are moving forward with, with this project. This is what council has given us to focus on and try to complete by uh, the second quarter of this year. And um, just in terms of public engagement, council also endorsed a uh, consult level of engagement. And so the plan as laid out in the project charter is to focus on, we did a lot of public engagement back in 2018 for those changes. And a lot of it overlaps with the topics that we're thinking about now. And so rather than lose all of that great information and input that we got at that time, uh, looking back at that to inform our future engagement as well. So we looked back, you would have seen in your packet an attachment with a summary of kind of the relevant questionnaire answers and things like that related to saturation limit and size limits from that previous effort. And that allows us to be more expedient and efficient with engagement right now rather than asking the same questions again. We also met with our community connectors in residence um, just last week to who kind of represent underrepresented groups in Boulder to discuss ADUs and got feedback from them. Uh, we obviously have our matters item tonight and the little asterisk just means there's an opportunity for open public comment at that meeting. Um, so council wanted us to focus on the board and commission our existing boards advisory board process to use that for public engagement. So things like tonight. So it's great to see a lot of people coming out to provide input tonight. Uh, similarly, we'll have a meeting with the Housing Advisory Board next week, where there's also open comment. We're going to have a study session with the City Council also next week. Um, there is not open comment at study sessions, but uh, written comment is always welcome and encouraged. 
And then similarly, we'll be meeting with the Board of Zoning Adjustments since they review all of the variances related to ADUs, and that'll be at their next meeting in February. We also have Be Heard Boulder, a virtual engagement opportunity where people can post um, their experiences with ADUs or issues with ADUs or thoughts about the updates. So kind of just a virtual, a virtual open house over there in the web um, that will be up for anybody um, between at, during this point. And then we're planning to have virtual office hours with staff if people want to have, um, you know, just ask questions of staff through February and March as we are working on the ordinance. Finally, we'll have the ordinance review public hearings, the typical public hearing process, as John mentioned, um, probably late February, early March is when you all would see the ordinance and have a public hearing. And then it would go forward to city council as well. So as John mentioned, we have laid out these four main questions. And um, like he said, I've organized the presentation kind of by each one. So feel free, I'll, I'll have a slide that looks very similar to this at kind of the end of each section and we can tackle questions and comments related to each one. So just to give you an idea of what's to come. Our first section is a little meaty because it's all of the data, just a summary of the data from the evaluation report and all the things that we heard. And then it'll dig into further um, saturation limits, size limits, and the, the future changes. So we'll start with the evaluation. So overall, we have in Boulder, we've had ADU regulation since 1983, which is now 40 years. So we have 40 years of regulation regulating ADUs. And you can see in this chart, it shows the number of ADUs approved each year since that time. And it also shows the kind of main significant regulatory changes that were made along the way. So you can see how those regulatory changes have affected the number of ADUs that have been approved. As you can tell, there's a big spike in 2019 after the last changes were adopted. So that's where we really wanted to look with this evaluation is how those changes affected ADUs and what were the big things that were actually barriers for ADU construction that might have been changed with those regulatory updates. Um, so yeah, we were looking at these four years, 2019 through 2022, the evaluation went through the middle of 2022. So you can see it was a record year in 2019 with 80 ADUs adopted. Uh, before that, it was usually about 10 or 20 that were adopted or approved each year. Um, and then we've seen the numbers kind of going down each year. There was certainly like a built up demand prior to those changes, um, but also we had COVID happen in the middle of that. So that certainly affected numbers as well. But overall, we had 200 ADU applications approved since that most recent code change went into effect um, through the middle of last year. So 200 were approved, 96 of them were built. Um, at the time that we completed the evaluation, 44 were still under construction and 32 were still in permit review. Um, so just to give you an idea of the numbers that we're looking at. Then geographically, this is the northern half of the city. You can see the purple little purple house is a attached unit. So that's the, the integrated within the same structure. Blue means that it is a detached unit. Um, ADUs for the most part are located in our lower density zoning districts, which are um, often on the Western side of the city. So that's why you'll see them mostly on the Western side. Uh, but as far as the Southern half of the city, you can see also kind of on the Western side, but also across 36, uh, depending on the zoning district. But just to give you an idea of where these are located throughout the city. And then some general um, data points about those 200 ADUs that we've seen since 2019. About two thirds of those are detached, so a different structure than the main house, and a third were attached uh, within the house. The average size of an ADU is 640 square feet. As you can see, they differ because there's different requirements for detached and attached. Um, and then an important thing to understand about our ADU regulations is that we also, we allow some flexibility for affordable ADUs. And so the definition of affordable ADU is that it's meeting 75% of the area median income. So you can see kind of in that small font at the bottom that that's a, a one, a, the equivalent of essentially of a one bedroom being about $1,700 a month. So if the owner chooses to do an affordable unit, they can actually have an increased size limit and a reduced parking requirement um, compared to a market rate unit. So 
that was new. Uh, that was a new option that was provided in that last update. And we saw about a third of ADU owners take that, take advantage of that AD, affordable ADU option and two thirds went with market rate. As far as the location, I showed you geographically, but just an idea by zoning district, you can see the vast majority of ADUs are located in our RL1 zoning district. Um, there is a lot of RL1 zoning in the city. So um, that is that we saw that consistently um, over the last few years. And then lot sizes, you can see um, about 8,000 square feet median, median lot size um, for those properties that have ADUs. Saturation limit was one thing we looked at with the evaluation because it those changes in 2018 increased the saturation limit in the RL1 and RL2 districts from 10% to 20%. I'll dig in a little bit more later about that, but just wanted to show that about um, over half or actually over three quarters either met the previous saturation limit of 10%, so they were below 10%, or they were in a district without a saturation limit. The saturation limit does not apply to every zoning district. It's just the RL1 and RL2. But there were 41 ADUs that were approved in the last few years that were above that previous limit of 10%, but below 20%. Sarah, I see your hands up. Yeah, I just, I'm, I didn't understand this uh, graph in the, in the, in the pamphlet either. So, um, I, first of all, is this uh, district districts? Is this all the ADUs? Is this just ADUs since 2019? I'm just and what is the 41 and what is the 20 percent? I just didn't quite understand all these numbers. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. So yeah, the the first number is the actual number of ADUs, and then it's the percentage of the total 200 that we're looking at. So the evaluation only looked at the recently approved ADUs. So that's of those 200. And because the saturation limit was 10% before, they would have everything from before that would have been before um, under 10%. So it's those 41 that took advantage of the increased saturation limit and were able to construct. Does that help? Okay. All right. And that, yeah. And then we also looked at the variances that have been. Uh, applied for and approved by the Board of Zoning Adjustment. So in the ADU regulations, you're able to vary the maximum floor area of an ADU. And so we saw that four applications went through to BOZA. All four were approved. They actually all four were the same situation where it was an existing basement um, that was slightly over or uh, either 27 square feet up to 500 square feet over the limit of a thousand. And all four of those were approved. Uh, excuse me, Lisa, can you yeah. describe the logic that was used to approve those? Yeah, um, I mean, the I think the common logic for those that were approved was that it was an existing basement. And in order to meet the floor area, they would have to put up just kind of a random wall in the basement just to cut that floor area, floor area up um, so that it didn't count as part of the ADU. So they found that it was an unreasonable change. Often it you know, would require um, significant modifications to an existing house. So I think that that was the main motivation for supporting those variances. Thank you. All right, so the next thing that we looked at, I mentioned that you know we're looking at all of the ADUs that were approved. We looked at the ADU applications that were withdrawn, but we also wanted to understand where the barriers might be for people that never go through the process. Like maybe they inquire about an ADU, they're interested in it, but they never take the step of applying for a, the application for an ADU. So the best way to do that was to look at our Inquire Boulder system, which is our customer service portal, portal where we get uh, over 4,000 <laughs> comments within just eight eight months um, related to zoning questions, just to give you an idea of what's going on with that. But we had um, 218 tickets that were related to ADUs in particular, and the vast majority of those 
um, are about whether people trying to understand whether an ADU is allowed on their site or specifically about the saturation limit. So we thought this was a really interesting finding, just looking at that and how commonly misunderstood the saturation limit is and how confusing it is for applicants. And it really sets an initial barrier for people either both perceived or actual about whether they can actually pursue an ADU. So I just pulled, these are direct quotes from some of these Inquire Boulder tickets, just to give you an idea of what we're seeing and the questions that come in related to the saturation limit. But I think the one in the top right corner kind of sums it up. We would like to consider an ADU over the garage of our home, but we need to confirm that the location is not saturated first. How do we do that without going through the whole process, fully submitting a full application and the fee? So we get a lot of questions like that coming in, obviously, to the city. And it's something that the a property owner cannot um, confirm themselves. So it's significant administrative time for staff to complete the calculation and um, figure out the saturation limit. And also because it's constantly in movement, the saturate, someone could ask this what the saturation limit is a week ago, but then if their neighbor applies for an ADU and gets that approved, their saturation limit has changed. So it's constantly in flux. Um, so those are some of the challenges with the saturation limit. Yeah, Georgie. I'm sorry, I'll hold I'll hold my question. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So we thought that that was an interesting finding, just seeing how how um, it was something that was coming up a lot in our internal stakeholder interviews that the saturation limit was um, a common issue, um, but that was really confirmed by looking at those tickets. And then I also mentioned that our um, Housing and Human Services staff helped us do a survey of all of the ADU owners. And what was nice about this is that they've done this survey in 2017 and 2012 as well. So we had some comparable data to see how things changed over time. So we sent out the survey to the 430 owners of ADUs in 2022. We got 212 responses. So that's almost a 50% response rate, which was great. Um, there's a lot more detail in the attached evaluation report if you want to see that, um, but some of the highlights is that in comparing it over time, we're seeing that a greater percentage of ADUs are being used actually as space for visitors or relatives rather than a housing unit or like a rentable housing unit. Um, and then we also saw that uh, about 40% of owners who chose that affordable ADU route um, chose it to reduce their parking requirement. We also asked about that initial idea that council had had about allowing a second ADU on the lot and 77% of eight current ADU owners said that they would not be interested in pursuing a second one. Yeah, Laura. I had a question about that last bullet point there where 77 people said they would not be interested in a second ADU. Is that, were they asked about constructing a second ADU from scratch, or if at the time they had applied to get their first ADU, they would have done two if it had been allowed. I, the reason why I ask that is because obviously each time you initiate a construction project, there's a significant cost and there would be significant savings if you could do two at the same time. So what was the question exactly that they were asked? Yeah, um, I could look it up. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it was more in the context of these are changes that are um, being considered as potential updates to the ADU regulations if it was changed so that you were able to do a second ADU, you know, in the future, would you want to do it rather than would you have wanted to do two at the same time? Does that answer the question? It does. I can, I can look up the actual wording of how they phrased it too. No, I think that was my impression from, from reading the more detailed explanation in the packet that it was more of, would you add another one now that you're done? Right. <laughs> um, and so just for the future in terms of if, if what you want to know is if people will be interested in doing two, you need to ask the question slightly differently. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of great information there that we got from the owner survey. Um, and there's a lot more in your packet. Um, but essentially the conclusions that we came to in the evaluation was that the changes that we really saw, uh, you know, quantifiably reduce the barriers to ADUs was the change to the saturation limit from 10% to 20%. As we mentioned, there were 41 properties that couldn't previously have done an ADU that were able to due to that change. As far as the maximum size, that probably had the biggest impact. 
um, because the previous maximum size of a detached unit was 450 square feet. In 2018, it changed to 550 square feet. And over three quarters of the detached ADUs that were approved in the last couple of years were over that limit. So they would not have previously been allowed. Um, in addition, there were maybe a dozen properties that um, were affected by a reduction in minimum lot size, so they were able to move forward with an ADU where they wouldn't have been before. And then a few new zoning districts were added, um, which also allowed a couple more ADUs. Um, and then through all of that uh, internal stakeholder interviews, talking to the withdraw the people that had withdrawn, the Inquire Boulder tickets, we also identified several remaining potential improvements that we thought would further bar remove barriers or reduce barriers to ADUs. So eliminating the saturation limits, reconsidering floor area that's based on those um, proven changes from the last round, uh, but also some other things which we've uh, we, we can talk about a little bit later as well, because this directly informed the scope of work that we recommended to council, but extending the expiration of approvals for ADUs, a height variance or flexibility, an option for existing structures, and then the general code clarification and process improvements. So that was really the outcome of the evaluation. I think it was really helpful to look back through all of that data, um, but also part of the um, the research that we've been doing over the last couple of months is looking at other cities and what they are doing with their ADU regulations. There was a summary matrix included in your memo packet. This is definitely um, over the last decade or so, ADUs have been a commonly taken up issue by many cities around the country. Um, so what we looked at, we looked at over 30 different cities that were comparable in terms of different features, which that's included in your attachment as well. But then we looked at these this array of different ADU regulations, and um, I won't read you the zoning wonky ones, but generally, where can ADUs go in that community? What do ADUs need to look like? And who can live there? That's what we were really trying to assess within these other communities. And the takeaways that we got from these other cities that we looked at was, first of all, no other city has a saturation limit for ADUs the same way that we do. Um, only a few of these cities have a minimum lot size. That's actually something that's been a common um, of the cities that have updated their ADUs maybe in the last two or three years. That's something that's commonly being getting, getting, they're getting rid of, um, a minimum lot size. Almost all the cities we looked at limit uh, ADUs to only one per lot. And then in terms of maximum size, the Boulder's maximum size of detached units is smaller than most cities. But if you look at Colorado cities, those are typically smaller than the rest of the country. Um, so around the country, it's typically about 800 square feet for a detached unit. In Colorado, it kind of varies more closer to 600, but Boulder's still on the smaller side of that at 550. In terms of parking requirements, most cities require either zero space for the ADU or one, and some provide variability based on distance to transit, things like that. Almost all say that ADUs can't be sold separately, and about half of the cities require owner occupancy, which is that the proper property owner lives on site. Yeah, Laura. Quick question. That first bullet point, you know, we, we heard a few commenters interpret that as that no other city in the country has a saturation limit for ADUs. Is that what you meant by that statement? Or are you just talking about those 34 comparable cities that you looked at? Yeah, so I've been, I mean, for the 34 cities that we looked at in depth, none of them have a saturation limit. But I've been, I'm not able to find any other city that has a similar saturation limit. I did look into the ones that they mentioned. The Chicago one, um, it's a pilot program. Interestingly, Chicago only in the last year or two has allowed ADUs. Um, so this is the first time, you know, they're 40 years behind us in adopting ADU regulations. And so they're doing it year by year. But it's not the same kind of limit because you can have two on a block per year, but obviously the next year you can get two more. And the way that our saturation limit works, if there's two, there's that's it. You can't ever get a third one if it's meeting the saturation limit. Does that make sense? Yes. And then I'd be happy to, I've, been, I've looked, done a lot of research trying to find a city. So I'd be happy to hear uh, if anyone can tell me one that another city that has the same kind of saturation limit as we do. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Lisa. 
Um, I was just going to say that I looked into this a long time ago, long before planning board. And at that time, I also could not find anywhere that had the same kind of saturation limit. So that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, but I, I also wasn't able to find one. It's kind of, it seems like a pretty unique regulation. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Uh, did any of the other cities have special rules for a permanently affordable, deep restricted type? There are, yeah, there's actually a couple other cities. I think Portland is the one that comes to mind, but I think there were two or three others um, in that matrix that I created uh, that do have some special regulations for affordability, but we are one of the only ones that I could find. So, so those other ones, did they have, you know, rules about relaxed parking or increased size, same way that uh, we do? Yeah, they were. Um, I'd have to look back in detail. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I believe in Portland, you can do a second ADU if it's affordable. So it's something like that, but it's typically like a, a relaxation of certain requirements, whether it's the exact same requirements that we have or not um, in, in, um, uh, in response to having the affordability component. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right. So there's a lot more um, in your packet as well, if you want to dig in more about the evaluation, but I know we've kind of taken questions as well, but are there any questions that I can answer on the evaluation report or anything else I can provide additional detail on? Yeah, Georgie. I had a, a question and it was in regards to, um, I was trying to square the survey that was done in 2012, 2017, and 2022, we were given percentages of different things. But um, if you could clarify the, the ADUs that were in place during that, so we can actually understand how the percentages match to what actually existed, that would be sure. helpful. Yeah, so the survey in 2022 was of 439 ADUs. The one in 2017 was of 230. And the one in 2012, this one's a little bit more of an estimate, but it was about 125. So that's the, th those numbers are the total ADUs in the city at that time? Correct. Got it. Thank you. That's yep. helpful. Yeah, thanks. Laura. Um, so in the packet, it talked about it's a sort of a curious finding that even the ADUs that were um, allowed to be market rate tended to rent for rents that were closer to the affordable market rate, which is 75% of what would be affordable or affordable to someone making 75% of the area median income. Can you talk a little bit more about that finding? Yeah, yeah, I wish we had our housing staff here tonight because I know that they could add more than I can. But when we do ask, I mean, it's not um, scientific because it's um, just whatever they tell us they're renting it for, you know. Um, but we did ask all of those ADU owners what they were renting at. And it does, it actually does stay um, close to or below what the affordable limit is. So we're seeing that 80, even if they're not technically affordable, they're typically um, lower rents for those ADUs, uh, regardless of whether their market rate or affordable. And do you know, why that is, you know, I could speculate on some possible reasons of why, but. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, with the limited size, there are smaller units, so that probably keeps costs down um, compared to other housing units. Um, but yeah, any answer I would give would be speculation. Okay, thanks. I think Sarah was next, maybe. Thanks. Um, I'm going to just two questions one is a follow-up on Laura's and then a separate one I the little graph you did on page 36 of the to of the total packet which is where you talked about the rents um I was just a little bit confused by um the the average uh rent of sixteen hundred dollars that is the average of the 48% that you surveyed, and that would include some permanently affordable and some market rate. Yes, yes. Okay, so we 
we don't actually, do we have any sense of like what the maximum rate rent is that people have charged and what the minimum, like, cause uh, it's not that I think this is a deceiving number. I just don't, I think it's an incomplete number because it includes the permanently affordable rents in there. So I'm just sort of curious what you can add if you have any more additional information about like what the range of rents are. Yeah, that's something I can look into further. Our, our housing and human services staff led the survey, so I'm not quite as familiar with it, but um, I think you make a really good point that that, does, that number does include the affordable ADUs. And I think because we asked a question about a f like why someone chose an affordable ADU, we should be able to parse out that data and be able to see what the difference is. So that's a really good point, and I'll definitely look, look into that and have that for next time you see this. Okay, thanks. Um, do you all mind if I ask one more question? Um, so I had a question then about, I had organized myself to the four proposals that were not to the four questions. Oh, okay. So I'm going to run through. I did have some questions about um, the, the, the survey itself. So um, not that I think it's a bad survey. I think you guys did a great job, but but um, you got 48% of the folks who you reached out to to respond. And then you have these uh, you know, smaller percentages of that 48% who are telling you about um, what, why they, uh, what would the primary benefit was and um, why they are, whether they are renting, actual renting or having family members or using it for office space or whatever else they might be using it for. Um, and I have to say, I came away um, uh, with a, a real sense that what, while there have been some rental units built, a lot of what is built is not, in fact, being used um, for housing rentals. And I'm curious if, I mean, I, I can read you my, the statistics that I wrote out, but I'm curious if, if that's a, if you all felt a similar finding. Yeah, I think that that was, that was kind of the main finding that our housing staff came to. And the difficulty is that obviously over the last three years, we've been going through a pandemic where people might be less likely to want to share their home with a stranger or with somebody else. So there might be some outstanding, you know, some, some unique circumstances of the last few years. Uh, but certainly that was something, that was one of the main differences that we saw. And that's why it's helpful to have this survey be pretty similar over the years. Um, is seeing that more people are using them for, you know, not an additional housing unit, but just extra space. So that was that was one of the main findings housing staff came away with too. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm sure I'll have other questions and I will come back through. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Georgie. Do you have any statistics about where these ADUs are being built relative to the property value where they're being built. So for instance, I'm just giving an example, right? So there was a there was a $900,000 house that sold in my neighborhood on on 4th uh Street uh and Dewey. Um it sold for somewhere around $900,000. So it was a perfectly nice little, you know, sort of 2,000 square foot house. It was perfectly livable. It was scraped uh, a new house was built there. Uh, I think Rosie Flivian was the architect. Uh, it sold for $5.875 million, uh, and it included an ADU. Uh, uh, so what I'm seeing in my neighborhood is a lot of potentially affordable or, or market rate affordable housing that's being scraped and new housing coming up along with ADUs because since they're scraping it, they're able to reconfigure things. And the ADUs are really being designed as just extra available space within a housing unit, not necessarily designed to rent. I mean, no one in a $6 million house is renting an ADU as far as I know. So I, I'm curious, it, it would be very helpful to get granular on sort of where these things are being built uh, and the property values where they're being built but also when a property sells with an ADU, what it sells for. Um, because 
I can also, I've also seen scenarios where uh, ADUs are built and then resold and the value of that ADU is included in the overall value of the house and therefore increases the property value substantially, blocking out what might have been an affordable single family home um, because now they have an addition on there. So I, I don't know how to slice that data, but I think it would be really helpful for all our decision makers to really understand how these things are being um, put together. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful point. We will talk with our data folks and see what we're able to do and whether we were able to parse that out, kind of that before and after, and what the property values of those lots are. Obviously, we know every parcel that has an ADU, so we should be able to get at least some data on that. Um, so yeah, we'll look into that. I think that yeah, would be helpful. That, that, that'd be great. Yeah, their assessed values or something like that would be super yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Mark. Hi, I'm not going to turn on my camera just because my um, Wi-Fi connection is very weak. And I'm afraid that corrupt uh, things. So um, you had mentioned in, in a prior slide that some number of people were uh, using their ADU for visitors or relatives. And so I, I find it there to be a, a huge distinction between someone building an ADU and using it for a guest house for occasional guests and those that um, would build an ADU and have their, uh, as someone who, you know, is caring for aging parents, etc. cetera, um, so lumping together, having a relative, uh, an aging mother or mother, a, uh, a, a son or daughter uh, who um, is uh, transitioning into different housing or whatever, whatever the situation may be, I, I find that lumping those two things together is not particularly helpful. So... Um, I'm curious, one, why you lump those two things together and, uh, and, and considering housing a person who's a relative as not adding an additional housing unit, I think is incorrect. So would you address that? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So um, sorry, I don't have this on a slide, but on page 35 of your packet, the overall packet, 35 out of 119, there's a chart that breaks it down. That was mostly just oversimplification for the bullet point um, for that slide. But you can see the chart there that um, the long-term rental to paying tenants went down from 64% of ADUs to 46% in 2022. Um, but housing for relatives went from 5% to 15%. Um, so that was a bigger jump than housing for visitors went from six to nine. So it was just a significant decrease in the number of, or the percentage of ADUs that were being used for long-term rentals. Um, but certainly we are seeing more housing for relatives. If that helps. So uh, housing for should do you consider that a housing unit regardless of whether it's zero rent or market rent for that relative that is a housing unit would you would wouldn't you agree yeah i think i'm i defer to our housing staff to see if they have different opinions um i can ask them but if that relative is living there long term then obviously they're not taking a housing unit anywhere else so that is their housing unit um and adus are often in many of the um documents about them and research done about them. There's a lot about aging in place and multi-generational living uh, that ADUs can do. So that's why one of the common names is mother-in-law suite. So um, yeah, I think the housing for relatives, that's still a housing unit. Yeah, It's just not a, okay, it, great. you just <laughs> might not have rent if you're nice to your mother-in-law. Right. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm sorry, Lisa, before someone, I just, just to, under clarify housing for relative when that's put in like to, to Laura's point about how questions are asked does housing for relative mean someone's living there or does that mean that that could also be a unit where a relative might come to visit and they might stay when they come there 
Yeah, we don't parse that out. So we just ask, how do you use, currently use your ADU? And then housing for relatives is one of the options. Yeah, so I, similar, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to nitpick, but I think if we're trying to nail down what Mark has, has referenced, I think is a really good point. It should be, you know, flagged as like permanent, you know, right. housing or something like that. Because my guess is if I was answering that, if I had people that were coming to stay with me and I was just had an ADU at my house, um, I'd say, well, that's housing for my relatives. Mm -hmm. so, just a yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. I think Lisa was next. Not sure. Yeah, no, I, I think this is great because this is actually exactly what I wanted to get into is just kind of a finer grained understanding of aging in place and of multi-generational families and of relatives using it. I think the point about, you know, maybe people who have relatives overseas who tend to come and visit and are retired and stay for three months at a time or something, you know, um, and, and that becomes perhaps more pleasant and livable for everybody if, if there's a little more division in the in the uh, space, depending on, on the relationship. But um, uh, I, I would love to understand that because I, I do, I, I that, that's what I've seen in a lot of the research and the data is that um, it can allow, and I think we saw some emails from community members about that, you know, where like they would actually build an ADU on the property, the primary owners who had lived in Boulder for a long time moved into the accessory dwelling unit, which might have been designed to be universally accessible. And then a child, um, you know, and their family moved into the main house that was now in place. Um, I also think of it in terms of, you know, because I have a, a little one, but in terms of childcare and so on, when, when I was, there were no daycare spots to be had, you know, COVID closed everything, nobody could staff. Um, and so I briefly had a nanny and so many of the people responding were like, are you, can you offer housing? Can you offer housing? Can you offer housing? Can you offer housing? Um, and I imagine that's also true for home health aides, you know, so as people are aging in place in their home, uh, you know, if they're able to provide one, that, that would make it easier for someone to take care of them, perhaps the hours that they needed, but, but two, it might be easier to attract someone uh, and, and have someone who doesn't have a crazy commute and can actually work the next morning when it's a snow day, like we're about to have tomorrow. Um, you know, so anyway, I, I, I don't, I don't know, I, I haven't dug as deep as I should into some of um, the metrics, but those are some of the things I'd be curious about is, you know, um, live in aids, live in childcare, um, family members and so on, because although those maybe don't increase, um, they, they may in a tertiary way increase units available if that's someone who would have otherwise rented something else in Boulder and could afford that would have chosen to do that, which maybe they will, maybe they couldn't. Um, but I think it does improve the livability potentially of you know certain housing stock for certain members of the community and mean that they can actually stay in their home uh, instead of having to move east or um, move into assisted living or something similar. Yeah, thanks for that. I think caretaking is another one that comes up a lot uh, with ADUs. We did ask in that same graph on page 35, long-term rental in return for other services like childcare and only 1% of people each year said that they were using it for that. Um, but yeah. What I'd say to that, though, just from a childcare perspective, is that you typically do pay wages in addition hmm. to potentially providing, like, it, it might be factored in, but usually that person would also be paid in the same for home health. Like, it's not really an exchange. It's just like a additional yeah. benefit sort of a thing. Yeah. yeah, that might be down to the wording of the question again. Okay, thanks. Sarah, you were next. Uh, all right, so... If I if this was not in the I, I can't remember now where the the um, questions about some of the administrativia problems and process problems were were they in the survey or were they in a separate part I just can't remember. Um, which question like? So I have some questions about um, the LLC issue and I had questions about the declarations of use and enforcement issues. But if they're not part of the evaluation, I will put those aside until we get to that. They were part of the evaluation, but we do talk, we'll talk about them in the simplification and clarification changes. So we could just okay. wait till question four, but yeah, yeah thanks. Wait. Thank you. I think John, I don't know, you guys bounce around. So if I'm putting you out of order, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, just a, a quick question. And that is following up on George's uh, comments. Have you had any contact with uh, property appraisers or, you know, uh, developers to see how they regard the impact of ADUs on, on their projects and valuations? We haven't done that yet, but I think based on this conversation, we definitely want to dig in more about the, the valuation. So I think that's something we'll do over the next couple of weeks, make sure to do. 
Right. I, I think that's particularly relevant with respect to what the impact is on you know affordable small uh, houses that wind up having an ADU built, and uh, then uh, they may long no longer be so affordable. So, I think it's very relevant. Thanks, John. Laura. Thank you. So like Sarah, I think I probably have some questions that might not fall into any of your sections. So I think there's like a catch all section at the end. Yeah, we can yeah. do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll put my hand down then. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on the evaluation? Okay. okay. I think also your comments, if you're prepared to make any on this, uh, on this report, this is the time to, to make them. Laura? I guess just one thing, um, you know, in the packet, you have a section on page, I think it's on page 20, where you talk about who would be impacted by the change in regulations. Um, I'm trying to pull that up. And I'm assuming those are people that you made an effort to do outreach to because they would be impacted. And you talk about residents and neighborhoods, underrepresented groups that might have an interest in ADUs, but maybe unfamiliar with the methods to offer input, city staff, city boards, and city council who are gonna have to administer all of this. But I don't I don't see anything on here just about, you know, renters, people who rent in the city of Boulder and whether they would be interested in an ADU versus a condo versus an ELU versus any other kind of living option. Um, so I guess I just was wondering if there's any effort made or any I don't I'm not sure I saw anything in the evaluation report where there was outreach specifically to people who live outside of Boulder but would like to live in Boulder and how attractive an ADU option might be. I know we did something similar to that for the East Boulder sub community plan in terms of trying to reach out to in commuters to see if this is even an attraction attractive housing option. Yeah, that's a good point. I think Generally, the thought is that the residents and neighborhoods would include renters, owners, everybody, um, but that outside of the like people that are currently living outside of Boulder is an interesting addition. I think that we're also looking back at a Boulder Valley Comp Plan community survey that was done in 2016 that had some questions about ADUs, which I think can be, um, it's helping to inform as well because that was a large statistically valid survey. So we'd be looking at that too, but um, we'll think through how we could reach out. We do have the Be Heard Boulder page, um, but if we could maybe do some promotion to place to uh, next door or something that would gather those people that might live outside of Boulder now. Yeah. There was a, that housing choice survey that was done several years ago. Also, we, we could look back at that and see if there were any questions specific to ADUs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are all great sources and also maybe touching base with um, Kathleen King or others who worked on the East Boulder subcommunity plan and making sure you have uh, that input that they gathered. Yeah, great. Thank you. Lisa? Oh, you're muted. I was just gonna say that I appreciate um, all the work that you put into it and that it's kind of in that tricky area where we really want the information on use case um, when what we can most easily regulate is built form, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, it may be to some extent occupancy, but not even that very well, perhaps. Um, so. Um, yeah, so just I just appreciate all the work that's already gone into this, and I think it's very in depth. And you know, we're we're adding you know additional potential context and information and other sources of data that I think will matter as we you know as this comes back to us and we look at it. But mostly, I just want to compliment you guys on doing a deep dive and kind of anticipating a lot of what you're gonna get from not just planning board, but a lot of folks. So good job. Yeah. I know it's tricky. They're they're little semantic questions. So no, yeah, this is great. This has all been really helpful. So thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I, these are sort of comments about the evaluation, but they're also sort of comments. So um, I, I have to say that in the data, I did not I did not take from the data that eliminating merely eliminating the saturation limit is the solution to the problem um, or to the challenge that we're trying to address, which is more affordable housing options and housing diversity. I, I, I totally understand 
that the saturation limit issue makes life way more difficult for staff and for applicants because the number keeps changing. But I'm not sure that just lifting the saturation limit is the solution to that challenge. Um, and, um, and, and because every neighborhoods and zoning districts are not the same thing, but obviously there are some neighborhoods that are really um, worried about just lifting the saturation limits. And I think we have to figure out how to, how to manage the, how to address those concerns, not manage them, address them. Um, uh, so that's a comment. And then um, uh, I think, I mean, I, I looked at the um, matrix of the other cities that you evaluated and some of them have literally no saturation limits, but some of them do. They, they don't call them saturation limits. There are some zones that are off limits. There are some neighborhoods that are off limits. So I just, I just think it's a mistake to convey this idea that we are unique in, we may be unique in using saturation limits at the moment as, our, as, our, as a tool, but we are not unique in trying to manage the expansion of, of this particular housing unit in order to give ourselves a constant opportunity to rejigger and revise as we need to. Um, uh, the other thing that's not mentioned in here at all, even though it's one of the key, it's not a key question, but it's one of the proposals is increasing the size of ADUs. Um, and there's no, there's no number on the table as to what that increase might be. Um, and so that's just missing. And maybe that'll come, I'm sure it'll come back when we get to the actual ordinance, but it would have been helpful in this discussion to know what you guys are thinking about. Um, and there's also no clarification. This is just a question. Um, we have these, this great lever for getting permanently affordable units in ADUs, which is that you get a bigger size and you don't have to park your car, you have a parking space. Um, and I think that's uh, the fact that we got so many permanently affordable units built is really, I think, quite an impressive outcome from that. But there, I'm just not clear whether the proposed change or the areas that you're proposing change eliminates that. I just, there's some lack of clarity in some of them that, that I think would be helpful for other, other boards, for ourselves and for um, council as we move forward in this discussion. Um, so I have other things, but because I organized my thinking in a different way, I'm having trouble finding it also. Okay. Yeah, and I think we have, I have a few more slides on both the saturation limit and the size limits as we get to number two and three. So I think that hopefully that will help to frame those questions that you're having as well with those. Georgie? Yeah, um, it, 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 uh, this is this is more of a, a comment doing the math on that survey, assuming that it's um, correct and its percentages relative to the absolute numbers of ADUs in Boulder. So as you mentioned, in 2012, there were 125. In 2017, there were 230. In 2022, there were 439. And if you look at the percentages of the survey between 2017, um, let's assuming that they're correct, that 64% were rented to long-term rentals, that netted 147 units versus in 2022, when we nearly doubled the amount of units, we netted 201 long-term rentals. So a net total gain over five years of 50 uh, units that were rented. And I, 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 that gives me a lot of pause because um, I, I know there are a lot of people in town that think that adding ADUs is um, a, a solution or a partial solution to um, rental housing that may be affordable. Um, but I go back to my example of, in this case, 2856 4th Street, that was a roughly 2,000 square foot house that now is a 4,800 square foot house with a legal ADU. And all it looks to me like is an alternative way to get a bigger house uh, and um, 
And so I, I really appreciate the affordable, the, the differences between the affordable ADU program and not. Um, my only concern about the affordable ADU program is that um, it was interesting, uh, I had a conversation with someone else that lives in our neighborhood um, who said they built their affordable ADU, again, just to add guest house, and they were willing to do the deed restriction uh, because they could eliminate parking and regain uh, more space uh, for entertainment. Um, and again, I, it's the devil's in the details because even though we doubled the number of ADUs over five years between 17 and 22, we may have only gained 50 rental units um, that may or may not be affordable. And I, I think we need to really think as a board on how this is structured. So, because I, I know a number of board members that are pro ADU, but against uh, larger homes and my, my general sense is, is that we're getting larger homes in a different capacity because of the dynamics in Boulder. And we really need to think about if we're trying to achieve um, affordable uh, rental housing, how, how we do that so that we don't end up with that kind of outcome that I think we're getting more of than we probably are admitting to ourselves. So just my comment. Yeah, thanks for those thoughts. I, I'll double check those numbers and talk with our housing folks to see what that net gain of what we think that is. Obviously, it's a survey of only half of the owners. That's a really good sample size. So um, we can kind of take some conclusions from that. But I would assume uh, half is statistically significant. Though, yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure. That. Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, I'll look into that um, to figure that out. And just one clarification that I wanted to make is that when you have an ADU, you don't get additional floor area on the site. So they could have had just, it's the same amount of floor area, whether they put it in an ADU or a house. So you know, if it's 500 square feet in the ADU, it's not like they're getting 500 extra square feet of what they could build in just the house. So yeah, just want to clarify that. I might also just add that I we don't I don't have the numbers in front of me. I don't know if Lisa does, but just the vast majority of ADUs are not typically in new builds. They're typically, you know, um, part of existing homes. It's um, I think the, the exception more than the rule to see a house scraped and, and a new house built with an ADU, but um, I'm not to say that that's not a, you know, growing trend. Yeah, thanks, Carl. I think Mark was next. Uh, this is a procedural question for our chair. We have four questions here before us as staff has put forward. And uh, as a board, we think broadly and Sometimes the questions, uh, the narrowness of the questions can be frustrating, uh, but I'm going to, I wanna ask, uh, are we doing our general thoughts at the end of these four questions? Can we go to the four questions and respond to the four questions and then add our thoughts or are we doing this on kind of an ad hoc basis? And if so, great. I have lots of thoughts I can share that are not necessarily uh, restricted to these four questions. Although, so my suggestion is, I think the most helpful thing to do would be to go through the questions and then to have a period for additional comment about ADUs or uh, board members thought. But, um, I would like to see us uh, address these questions and then address additional items. Yeah, that's what we're doing, Mark. So, well, so, uh, <laughs> so you will get a chance okay. again right. to, to look it, at the- it, Well, I, I, guess, I guess I'm I'm hearing a lot of things that are not uh, addressing the question at hand, which the current question is number one, uh, and so anyway, I, I'm my maybe I'm misperceiving it, but uh, a little a, some more structure here to our q and a, I think might be helpful. Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. I think that the intent for this question is really things that are related to the evaluation report. And the evaluation report 
uh, was so comprehensive that it co covers all the ADU topics. So I think that's where we've kind of muddied the lines. But yeah, it's, it was intended to be more of just clarification about the evaluation report at this point. And then after we get through saturation limits, size limits, clarifications, then if there's remaining questions that don't relate to those, we can get to those or comments. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Laura. Laura, your hand is up. I support Mark's push to move on, but I do just want to make sure I understood the exchange between George and Lisa and Carl about um, uh, whether having an ADU gives you additional floor area. So my understanding, and this is a part of why I'm sorry ML's not here tonight to contribute, but from talking to ML, she's very insistent that when you build an ADU, the, the regulations that govern what can be built on a site don't change in terms of the square footage that's allowed, the height that's allowed, all of that, the open space that's required per zoning district, none of that changes. And the ADU plus the primary structure added together have to still stay within that limit. So somebody could build one gigantic single family home. They could build a modest single family home with a luxury ADU or a small ADU. They still have to stay within those same limits. Am I understanding that correctly? Yep, you're 100% correct. I have a graphic in a couple slides that shows that too. Okay, then I will shut up and let you move on. Oh, John, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to focus my comments specifically on the report. I, I, I would say that I think this is extremely useful. You've done a beautiful job. But the surveys uh, are a source of concern to me because basically, in if I understand correctly, you've reached out to contact as many people who who ultimately have or would like to in some at some point build an ADU. You know, people who inquired but were turned down or didn't pursue, uh, or or something like that. But we haven't heard from the people who are concerned and uh, resisting uh, the uh, addition of ADUs in their specific neighborhood. And so what I'm wondering about is the degree to which uh, inquiring, learning about why people are resisting them, uh, trying to figure out why, why the resistance is there, is not a part of this report. And it seems to me that for the for the sake of objectivity and political comity, if nothing else, uh, that's, a, that's a very important uh, element that people need to be aware of. And uh, it's not obvious to me how one obtains that sort of uh, feedback, but it is important. Yeah, I think that's... Uh important point to make, and I think the in distinction to think of is that this evaluation report was really intended to look back at the last three years and the previous code change and what impact that that had. So that's why we were looking at the, you know, the ADU owners, people that had applied, people that had inquired. The objective of that evaluation report was looking back at those changes. And so I think that's why that focus was that there. But I think moving forward from this point on, the public engagement focus, obviously we heard, we you all got several letters and we heard from people earlier tonight. Um, so moving forward, we'll be talking more about the impacts of ADU regulations and what those concerns might be in concert with what these proposed changes might be. Okay, thanks. The, the, the other point, and it's related, uh, re pertains to the saturation limits, and we'll talk about it later. But I think the the interesting element is that other cities that you've identified, they are trying to deal with the same concerns that that Boulder is with the saturation limits, but in different ways. And so I, uh, it's important to to make that very clear. Uh, rather than pointing out satur just eliminating saturation limits without uh, trying to address the reason that they were put into place. Understood. Thanks. You know, yeah. Laura? I just want to say, you know, I uh, completely understand and support John's concern that we need to hear from everybody across the range of opinions on this. Uh, I really did appreciate that in the packet, 
um, you know, in one of the appendices there, we had um, the results of the previous Be Heard Boulder survey um, and engagement that was done in 2016 to 2018, including um, many, many pages of verbatim comments, both from people who supported things like uh, increasing saturation limits or eliminating them entirely, or, or who did not support um, such, you know, uh, changes to the saturation limits, uh, increases to the size limits. So I think, and I found all of those comments, both pro and con, to be uh, very personal and very enlightening. So I wanted to thank staff for including all of those bullet points. Um, so I think I think we do have, I imagine a lot of the concerns are the same. A lot of the people who would respond are the same. I do think probably some things have changed. So updating some of that data would be good, but I, I do appreciate that the wealth of comments that were already collected and that we have access to that. Um, thank you. I actually have just two questions about the data or whether two questions about whether there's more in that you can report that explains the data. Um, the first is, do, do you did the survey ask or try to evaluate why the percentage of long term rentals has gone down? Like, do, is there any uh, additional information that was asked in the in the survey that might explain that there wasn't like a follow-up question, question specifically about that but I know that we'll make sure to have our housing staff next <laughs> next <Okay>. time um, <laughs> but I know that they dug through like the the written comments for the survey so there might have been some additional information there but we didn't necessarily ask like why did that change or how did that change it might, um, just be, it might be interesting because if we're trying to divide design an ordinance that increases affordable housing units that are affordable and that are rented, rented, we would like to know what the motivation, I think we'd want to know the motivation. And then the second question is also about the data. Um, and it just was prompted by something George said, if someone gets a permit to build a permanently affordable ADU, are they required to actually rent it out? Not necessarily. They just have, if they were to rent it, they have to stay under that limit, the, the area median income limit. And so is there, um, maybe this is a legal question, can, is, or we don't have to ask a lawyer, but can we think about um, figuring out a way to make that a requirement <laughs> so that we're actually getting the benefit that we wanted out of that uh, type of unit with the extra space and the parking requirement, elim the elimination of a parking requirement. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I mean, some things come to mind like enforcement and, or also requiring a rental, a rental license. So I think there's options there. Um, we don't have Hella tonight, but um, we will, we'll talk through what those options might be. All right. Those were just my follow-up questions. I am zipping my lip till the next set of questions. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, jump in here. We've been going for a couple hours. Is uh, do we need a break? Okay, let's let's take a ten minute break. Uh, I'm back at uh, eight nineteen p.m.
Hi, John. It's Mark. Hey, hey. Uh, where are you? Hey, hey John. Um, so I have a, uh, a hard stop to power internet. The, the staff's room I'm using to, to attend this meeting that for you locally would be nine o'clock. So in 40 minutes. Uh, and I have a few comments and I don't want to um, uh, I, I'll be brief as I can, but I, I'm going to ask your diligence as we get close to nine o'clock your time, if I would be able to, uh, if I haven't been able to conclude my comments, if you give me a few minutes to do that, and then I'd have to leave the meeting. That's fine. Just, just let me know when you're ready to, when the time is right for you to do that. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Sounds like you're someplace very glamorous. Well, it, it's 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 remote. It's not super glamorous. It's a uh, it's a, a British Columbian uh, backcountry skiing uh, cabin. It is catered with the most delicious food, uh, and I happen to be in the chef's quarters where the internet is the best. Uh, and so, but because she cooks breakfast, lunch, and dinner, including baking. Uh, she goes to bed at eight uh, BC time, nine your time, mm. and uh, so that's my that's my <laughs> that's my. She has generously she's been very generous with letting me sit in her cabin to uh, attend the meeting. Okay, well that's my definition of glamorous. What your experience there? So. <laughs> that's for you. Okay. Anyway, I'm just certainly enjoying it. Just say when it's time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I think we can start moving ahead again. Uh, so uh, shall we move to uh, to the second question? Lisa, you can take it from here. All right. Great. So the remainder of the presentation is focused on these um, upcoming updates to the ADU regulation. So what we'll be working on over the next couple of months. Just a reminder, this is the same slide we saw earlier, but the ADU project scope of work is focused on considering eliminating the saturation limit, modifying the size limits or updating the method of measurement, clarifying and simplifying the regulations and improving the approval process. So we'll start off with the saturation limit. Um, we talked, we've already talked a bit about it, but in the RL1 and RL2 zoning districts, there is a limit to the number of ADUs that can exist within a 300 foot radius. So this overly simplistic graphic gives you an idea of, say there were 10 houses, 10 properties within 300 feet, only two of those properties can have an ADU. Importantly, we also include legal non-conforming structures in that. So if one of those yellow ones was already illegal non-conforming, like a duplex in a single family zone, that would count in the calculation too. So if you already have two legal non-conforming, you can't have any ADUs essentially in this 10 property scenario. Um, so that's how the saturation limit works. It's a part of the code that has been in place since 1983. And so from the onset of the initial ADU regulations in Boulder, as I mentioned, that was 40 years ago. Um, Boulder was really on the forefront of re-legalizing accessory dwelling units. If you go to most historic cities, you'll find accessory dwelling units in carriage houses or things like that. Um, historically, before single family zoning, there would have been accessory units on these properties. We had single family zoning come into place in about uh, post-World War II, um, which uh, prohibited a second unit in single family housing. But in the 80s, many cities or several cities started to bring that back and re-legalize that. So Boulder was on the forefront of that. And understandably, there were questions or concerns about how bringing those additional units would impact the city. 
And so now it's been 40 years of having accessory dwelling units in the community. Um, we've also seen the impacts of ADUs through other communities as well, because this is something that's uh, become much more popular around the country as other cities have caught up to Boulder. Um, but for the most part, most cities, um, instead of using a saturation limit, I know we've talked about different kinds of limits that um, cities will use, whether that's which zoning districts they're allowed in, um, things like that, and various design standards and whatnot. Um, in order to mitigate the impacts of ADUs rather than have a saturation limit, they rely on existing zoning standards. So things that we already have in the zoning code related to compatibility and form and bulk, um, the size of structures, things like that, um, are how most cities mitigate the, choose to mitigate the impacts of ADUs rather than having this um, formula of a saturation limit. So Laura, I mentioned that I would have a graphic for you. This is a graphic that puts together all of the regulations that impact the design and location of an ADU. So um, in the blue is everything that impacts the principal structure, the main house, so the maximum height of the structure, the front yard setback, things like that. There's also, we have our compatible design standards. So that's like the set length of a wall that you can actually, like a single wall that you can have without having to move the design back, things like that. The bulk plane, which is how much you can, there's like an angle that comes up from your setback, uh, that, that's how much the building can go into that bulk plane. We have maximum number of stories, we have a maximum floor area ratio, which again, which we talked about, doesn't change whether you have an ADU or not. A maximum building coverage, which is how much um, of the land can be taken up by a building. We have our typical setbacks in all of the different districts. So this example is an RL1 hypothetical example, 7,000 square foot lot for a market rate ADU. And then in the yellow are all the um, all the standards that uh, specifically apply to accessory units. So there's a minimum separation. There's a maximum building coverage that you can have within that rear yard setback. Um, and then specific, there's other rear yard setbacks for accessory units for the actual ADUs. Obviously, there's maximum size. We've talked about that. We require owner occupancy, so the property owner has to live on site, which um, is intended to mitigate impacts if the property owner is living on site. We have occupancy limits that limit the number of people that can be on the site. The occupancy limit, whether you have an ADU or not, is the same. ADUs have their own maximum height. Um, there's related, the related standards about building coverage. There's a minimum lot size. We have a parking requirement. Um, often a concern is the increased parking, but we do have the parking requirement. Um, and there's even more, it even gets drills down into more details for attached uh, ADUs, how they have to screen if they have a side entrance and detached ADUs have to have a specific amount of open space for the detached ADU and how the attached ADU has to maintain an interior connection. So all of this to say that there are a number of regulations that apply whether you have an ADU or not, or that apply to the ADU that dictate the design and location of that ADU. And which most cities would rely on to mitigate the impact of those ADUs. So I just wanted to lay that out there. I know throughout our zoning code, it can get kind of complex. So I thought looking at it kind of graphically on how that really affects where an ADU can be placed and the impact that it can have on neighbors, um, and as well as the relation to what, you know, if a, a neighbor wants to build a garage, what they're subject to as well. So those are kind of the background slides that I wanted to give on the saturation limit, um, just some of the history and also those form and design standards that most cities would rely on to mitigate ADU impacts. And the question I have for you is whether you have comments related to the proposed elimination of that 20% saturation limit in the RL1 and RL2 districts. I think Georgie was first. Yeah. Um... I just have a, a question on the previous slide, and then I have a question, uh, a comment on the saturation limit. So the, the question was, this owner occupancy required. So if someone, that's at, at that's a time of construction, is that right? Yeah. Like, well, how does that enforce after the fact? So if they um, apply for a rental license, we also check the owner occupancy, but at the time of ADU application and also the building permit, we, we require a, a, a form of proof that they are occupying the property. 
so if 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 I built a if I built a uh, an ADU on my property, then sold my property to an investor, they couldn't rent the ADU separately. No, they could not. So there always has to be a per a, one of the owners on site. Sure. Okay. Whether the and the owner can live e either in the ADU or the the principal structure, but that's um, uh, yeah, that's helpful. I, I was I want to understand how that worked. Okay, um, on to the saturation limit question. We go back to that slide. So um, I had a question, more of an informational question, because I think in the previous set of slides, um, you said there was thirty nine comments of four thousand inquiries or whatever the the number four hundred inquiries um that were put in that were related to the saturation limit um i don't know if you can find that one to look at that real quick yeah sure it's this one that you're talking about yeah the one after that which was some of the excerpts yeah oh, so okay. i guess my question is like you you said the one in the upper right um encapsulated people's concerns confirming lo that the location is not saturated first the 420 dollars fee the administrative burden I guess my question is, um, it may not be a question that you can answer, but this seems like a dynamic tool could be pretty easily developed to give people an answer pretty quickly. Is there a tool like that that exists that's administered by the city? And if not, could, I mean, because all of this seems like it's, seems like it's just like a, you know, it's a question mark and it's a process to get the answer, but I got to imagine if we know every ADU that's going up, there should be something that's dynamically updated that tells us whether or not they're in a saturation limit. Yeah, and I'll, I'll ask Charles and Carl to speak to some of the non-conforming things related to this, but we do have a tool, but only staff can look at it. So, um, and the public can see where all of the ADUs are in our public mapping. Um, but because there is that, what I mentioned, that non-conforming structures and co-ops and other things play into the saturation limit, um, that is not public information. And so that is why the saturation limit that someone would look at just based on ADUs would not be accurate. And one of the is other issues is also with timing. Um, you know, if you look it up in April, what your saturation limit is, and then two of your neighbors apply for ADUs after that, your saturation limit is completely different. Um, and it's totally unique based on each property. So um, I don't know. Car I'm sorry, when you say when you say the non-conforming zoning is not public, what does that mean? It means it's not available to the public? Yeah, that uh, Carl and Charles, I feel like you could answer this one better. Yeah, the, the saturation limit includes any kind of non-conforming duplexes or other non-conforming type units in that calculation. Uh, it treats them like they're ADUs. So staff would have to research, you know, where those are to factor that into the calculation. I, I think either way, I mean, we, we don't know where those are, like, we can't just add that into a dynamic tool. I mean, I think obviously there there would have to be some time and money, you know, put into a, a new tool or mapping tool. There's also the administrative burden of constantly having to update that. Um, that that's something that's difficult, you know, under the circumstances of how many applications we have and and projects and so forth. Yeah, and, and George, it's a great question. I don't know that we actually do know where all of them are at this point. I mean, some of them have been you know, kind of historically grandfathered in for, for decades. So um, it, it would certainly be a lift to, to try and maintain something like that. Okay, thanks. Sarah. Is that you, Lisa, whispering? Um, I will, I'll let Mark go first, because I know he has a, a timeout at nine o'clock. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And um, so, uh, the, the the question is: is what are our thoughts on the on the saturation limit? And uh, my thoughts are uh, that rules and regulations are a fundamental part of American society, but they they only really work well when they are comprehensible by uh, your general citizenry, and they're enforceable, they're understandable, and when they're not, you breed uh, anger towards government, 
you uh, breed non-compliance. And I think of, uh, and John will probably be able to uh, correct me because I, I might be wrong, but I think about water use uh, and you know, first in use, first in right, and where that has landed us today in our situation. I think about our tax code. And I think that, um, and the unfairness uh, of our tax code, the way it, it treats rich people better than poor people. So, and I look at this and I think about, put myself in a situation where, gee, suddenly after an elderly parent takes a fall or uh, uh, a child or whatever it might be, ends up in a situation where uh, an ADU would um, help someone stay out of an institution or help them move forward in life under difficult circumstances or an illness. And I think, gee, if I walk into the city of Boulder's planning department and I say, hey, how can I do this? And the answer is, well, let me check it out for you. And, and it comes back with, no, you can't because your neighbor got there first. That is one of those things where land use code should be applied equitably, reasonably, uh, with some sense of flexibility, but it, it needs to be applied in a way that doesn't breed uh, anger, contempt, or just misunderstanding, uh, and sadness. So when we when we have a, a code that encourages people to, uh, you know, gee, I have the ability because my neighbors haven't built an ADU, I have the ability to do it, and I have the wherewithal of do, to do it. I have cash on hand, so I'm going to do it because that's the smart thing to do for me financially. That is that is the kind of uh, piece of code that uh, we don't want. So uh, if you're asking for my input on the, uh, uh, the saturation limit in RL1 and RL2 districts, I uh, think they should be eliminated. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, Lisa, you've mentioned many times the impacts of ADUs and, and you know, impact, I think, uh, for the most part, is perceived by people as a pejorative uh, that, wow, this in impact is short for negative impact because um, that's, that's just the way we, we generally speak about impacts. And um, I think that when we talk about negative impacts, and I read all the emails and all the correspondence from uh, all the people that wrote in, and when People have concerns, and I want to respect the concerns about parking, about traffic, about noise, about any number of things. Those are respectable concerns. Those concerns need to be addressed directly. I consider our parking policy, as you all know, to be a, essentially a failed policy. We, we, we have gone through years of uh, attempting to reform our parking code and we have done so insufficiently and incorrectly. And so, and so trying to address parking through a housing and land use policy is, is backwards and, and wrong and, and ineffective. Uh, same with traffic, same with noise. The city of Boulder, I think um, many times uh, I, I sympathize with the people in Martin Acres and on the Hill uh, who have written to us about noise. We have ineffective, uh, ineffective code enforcement on, on real impacts on those people, but, but limiting housing or uh, restricting housing for uh, the people that, that want to live, uh, you know, a grad student wanting to live in a 500 square foot pay, space on the hill, you know what, it, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong way to go about having a noise code enforcement or a parking code enforcement 
is to, to limit ADU. So um, I just wanna say that I think that there are positive impacts to ADUs for ADUs to our community. Uh, those would be uh, housing affordability, a variety of housing, um, multi-generational living. These are things that, um, that do have positive impacts and they're not, they're not uh, well measured in, in the evaluation report. I think the evaluation report is great. And I understand the need for data consistency year over year, and you can't just always change the questions or the data becomes invalid. But I, I, I just wanna say that, um, that the use of, of impacts uh, as a pejorative without inclusion of impacts, uh, positive impacts on our community is a deficiency and uh, we need to deal with our other problems directly and rather than through, um, uh, rather than through a land use code. Thanks. Just a couple of follow-ups. Um, one thing I didn't mention about the saturation limit is that we also administer a waiting list for people that don't meet the saturation limit, um, just in case someone, one of their neighbors is ever to remove themselves or to remove their ADU. And we do have 12 properties that are currently on that waiting list, um, but there's little to been little to no movement in the last four years of that waiting list. So I just realized I had forgotten to say that. Um, but also, Laura mentioned the public engagement summary from 2018 and all of those verbatim comments and several of the comments related to the saturation limit had the same point that you did of, um, you know, if your two neighbors get the ADU first, how is that equitable for the remaining neighbors um, who never will get the chance or will stay on a waiting list for decades? So right. thanks for that. Yeah. And the only thing I'll follow up to that is if uh, if I'm on a list and I realize my neighbor also is behind me on the list and I'm trying to decide, gee, do I really need this ADU or not? Well, if I know that my ability in the future, I have a, I have a good spot in line now, but if I jump out of line, I'm going to lose my spot. And I know that my neighbor will get my spot again, it's a perverse incentive to just stay the course, build the ADU and figure it'll all come out in the wash financially anyway, thereby kind of uh, screwing my neighbor. And so that was, I just wanted to add on to that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it certainly adds complexity and the fact that the, the limit is constantly changing and can change at any minute um, is pretty much unlike any other zoning standard we have. Uh, Sarah. Okay, um, I will agree with Mark on one thing, which is uh, we have inadequate enforcement of almost everything in town. I think the two people or the one and a half staff people we have doing enforcement is not adequate. Um, okay, um, I am opposed to a uniform lifting of the saturation limits and I will I come at it from two different way, two different paths. The first is, I think it's been made clear today in this discussion that we aren't actually getting a lot of housing out of, out of our ADU, our current ADU regulations. So it isn't clear to me that just lifting the saturation limits will get us more, will get us a lot more alternative, um, uh, diversity of housing uh, types or actual additional housing, since what we're seeing is a pretty significant decline in the use of ADUs to, as rental units um, and some percentage of the permanently affordable units not being actually used as rental units at all. So um, I, I, I think we're, we're, tr we're trying to, we're trying to, we want to address housing, but the lifting of the saturation limits seems to me more of a slash and burn solution to a process problem that the that the city has in terms of the constantly moving where's the 300 foot radius and the, all that kind of stuff. So I just don't, I don't I don't have an alternative 
but I just don't think lifting the saturation limit is the solution to the problem you're trying to solve. I think if you can come up with a series of regulations that adequately, that guarantee that the units being built are used for housing, that then we can have a conversation about saturation limits. But until you do that, it seems to me that we are, you're, you put the cart, the cart has been put before the horse on this one. And then also, I do think the neighborhoods that are surrounding the university are, are really um, challenged here with this, in part because so many of them have, and this goes to the question George brought up about the um, non-conforming units. So the, the presence of those non-conforming units included in the saturation limits is, is very, very important because it has a lot to do with uh, population density. Like look on the hill where you might have three houses in a row and then on the corner is an apartment building or a sorority that has dozens and dozens and dozens of residents. Um, and that has to be included in how the city and I'll put aside the use of the saturation limit because I, I just think it's, I think we're going down the wrong path. I don't think that's the question we should be asking. But um, you do want neighborhoods to be um, neighborhoods and not to be overwhelmed. And I think the university area neighborhoods are just finding themselves totally overwhelmed. And in some ways, I feel like the city keeps trying to solve the university's problem which is that the university keeps growing, but does not provide enough housing for its students. And so our neighborhoods, especially the ones around the, the university have to absorb all of, absorb that population. And that to me is a problem. Um, and then let's see. Um, 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 I do think it's worth looking at um, what, I mean, I appreciate that you've done the city comparison, but it would be helpful to uh, maybe dig down into some of the cities that are university towns and sort of is that not just the data, they do have this, they don't have this, this is the size, whatever. Like what was their rationale and what have they changed over time? What have they learned through their processes? I think that would help us as well. Um, but specifically university towns of approximately the same size, because I. In many ways, this is the um, this is this is a huge part of our challenge. Um, so I will leave it at that. But um, again, I I think we may be asking. I think the saturation question can't be even discussed until we have figured out how to guarantee what gets built is actually used for rental housing or for housing. Yeah, thanks for all those comments, Sarah. Those are really helpful. Um, just one point of clarification, those the comparison cities, with the exception of looking at the other cities in Colorado that might not have universities, all of them have similarly sized universities, uh, because I do, I agree that having universities just create a unique housing um, condition in any city. So that's why we, we did try to make sure that those were looking at university towns as well. Thanks. I think Laura was next. I have a lot to say about this, or at least a fair amount, but I want to note that we're going to lose Mark in 14 minutes or less, and so I was wondering if this is an appropriate time to invite Mark to give the rest of his comments on all of the questions. Fair enough. Uh, Mark and I had talked about that, and uh, he had said he was going to let us know when he's ready, but it's almost time, sure. Mark. Um, Let's hear it. Well, uh, you know, I, I was like, how oh, do I raise my hand now? So. Um, thank you, Laura, and and I, I will drop off the call, uh, the meeting, um, in in twelve minutes. So, um, I'll take this opportunity, uh, I'll, and I'll try to be brief. Um, the um, <clears throat> regarding the allowable size of ADUs or clarifying the floor area measurements for ADU, again, harking back to my earlier comments, clarity, simplicity, uh, understandability and fairness in the size determination versus an arbitrary maximum uh, seem, I, I would like greater flexibility to be shown in the size of ADU 
based on lot size, based on uh, the size of the current building, which, you know, if, if um, anyway, I, I would like more flexibility there. And again, there's some, there's some nuance there between an internal ADU and an external ADU. And um, so uh, I would like to see greater flexibility and the potential for larger ADUs. Um, so that's my answer on that one. And um, of course, uh, simplification and clarification uh, is always a, an excellent goal in, in city governance, in any sort of governance, but especially in, in city governance where um, regular folk need to uh, encounter their planning department and, um, and have some understandable results from them. So I'm in support of all your attempts to simplify, clarify, and make more fair um, the changes. I have a final comment I, 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 and, a, and a question. And since Hell is not here tonight, I don't know if Elliot is on the call, but I am sorely missing the contribution of ML. And I am not fully aware of everything that went into ML's um, not being with us tonight, but my understanding after serving on several boards and commissions and so forth is that uh, this is a staff informational item. There is not a public hearing. There is not a vote. There is not a, um, this is not quasi-judicial. And I think it, uh, if there has been any attempt by uh, any board members to try to keep someone with expertise in a subject that an advisory board is advising upon, I think that's inappropriate. So I, um, again, I, I just, I make that comment and I'll leave it to staff and our legal department and other board members, but um, I know that I am missing the input from someone who uh, I think uh, their, their information, their thoughts would uh, benefit us all on the board and benefit the community. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Have fun skiing and we'll look forward to some uh, good stories when you get back. All right, thank you all. All right, uh, Lisa, why don't you carry on with, uh, with the- Okay, I think Laura, Laura, you were next since you ceded your time. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. So we're on the question about the saturation limit and you want to know if we have questions or comments related to this. Um, so first I have a question which is that we did get uh, emails, letters from several folks who live in um, neighborhoods near the university that were concerned about um, overcrowding basically in their neighborhoods because they're small lots. There are already problems with parking and um, some of these non-conforming uses that create um, you know, more occupancy than would normally be in a neighborhood with that zoning. And my question is, you know, do staff have any thoughts about you know how would you respond to that are any of those arguments compelling to you you know what is staff's response to those concerns sure um i think obviously they're valid concerns and there's unique situations um with those non-conforming uses due to zoning history over time in boulder um however i would point out that there are higher density districts that allow ADUs, so where you could build apartments and duplexes and conforming multifamily, those don't have a saturation limit. So the saturation limit is really intended to preserve existing single family neighborhoods. And if those neighborhoods, um, you know, because of zoning over time, maybe went to multifamily, then back to single family, 
Um, they obviously have a different zoning history and different character, but I think that that saturation limit, the fact that it doesn't apply to our higher density districts, perhaps is a, a analogous to uh, the situation, despite it being an, an RL or a lower density residential district. And another point that I would make is that um, you know, the non-conforming uses, they would not be permitted to have an ADU. So that would not be exacerbated on those particular lots. It would be where there might be a single family house would be able to have an accessory dwelling unit. But again, we have these other standards like design and regulation, uh, design and location regulations that would limit um, the impacts, positive and negative <laughs> impacts of ADUs um, in a way that most other cities do without having to have the saturation limit. Um, and then Carl, I know Carl knows like all of the zoning history of everything. So I don't know if you have anything specific to add um, uh, that you might add. I, mean, I don't know where we land on the topic. I mean, like, like Lisa said, I, I think we certainly hear the concerns from, from neighbors that already experience a neighborhood that has more intensity than they'd like and potentially adding more ADUs could add to that intensity. Um, what I'm thinking about is like tools that we could use, you know, to mitigate that. I mean, I, I think maybe it might be helpful to hear from board members and ultimately council. There, there are some other communities uh, that we researched that have different ADU regulations by neighborhood. And obviously we're trying to keep things simple and not add to the complexity uh, but there there would be mechanisms for maybe not applying it in certain neighborhoods and allowing it in other areas uh, but again um, we'd want to hear from the board on that whether that's something we should look into um, as we move into topics like occupancy there are other um, cities that have overlays that they put over certain areas of their cities that have that freeze the occupancy and allow a higher occupancy elsewhere. That's something we could do here for occupancy and or ADUs. So I think we'd wanna hear from the board if that were a concern that we should treat neighborhoods that are around the university differently because of their history. Um, that's just, we'd, we'd be looking at some tools like that. I also think it would be helpful to understand which impacts are um, most negative or like what what are the potential impacts that are most negative, whether that's parking, like if parking is the main problem, um, you know, maybe there's a different parking requirement in those neighborhoods or something, or if it gets down to um, noise or other or occupancy related things, um, maybe that's just something that's an enforcement issue or things like that, um, you know, really getting down to instead of the broad ADU potential impacts, what those might actually be and how we could address those. Okay, thank you. Another clarification question. Um, we heard a bunch of folks on the um, public comment period talk about allowing two ADUs on one property. And I know that that was something that city council had asked you to look at. Is that something that fell out when you rescoped it, having more than one ADU on a property? Correct. So once we went through the evaluation report, we just didn't see that that would have a major impact in reaching council's objective, which is to allow more or to increase the number of ADUs in the community. So, um, and seeing that almost every, or I think every other city that we looked at limited it to one ADU per lot. And so that's pretty common. Um, and the survey results that indicated that not many of the owners would, would want to move forward with that. And and also, we have never received an inquiry for a second ADU on a lot. So um, there just didn't seem like that would, in terms of, I think I said earlier, getting the most bang for your buck, that change we didn't feel like would make much of an impact. So that's the point we made to council and focusing more on saturation limits and size limits and those clarification issues we thought would have more of an impact than focusing on that one. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, currently only one ADU is allowed per property, whether it's attached like somebody's basement or like a mother-in-law unit built directly on the back of your house or detached one per property. Correct. It's, um, and that's not proposed to change. Correct. Okay. All right. I just, I think that there are a lot of people that have the impression that you could have three separate buildings with these changes and that sounds like that's not what's being considered. No, that's not part of the scope at all. Okay, all right. Um, 
so then, you know, I, I heard you talking about, I, I think this is really important because I think there's some misperception in the community that allowing ADUs would allow you to cover more square footage on the lot, decreasing the permeability, adding intensity, um, that it would allow for greater height than the original structure, um, and that it would allow for more occupants. And I think that what I have heard is that the way our ADUs are regulated, you're not, so, so if a person could rebuild or expand their structure, right, um, there are regulations that govern that, and the ADUs would not exceed that, right? So if a person wanted to have a renter, they currently have the option of having an ADU, or they could just expand their square footage in their house and have a renter in their house, with, and that is currently legal. Is that is that correct if they get a rental license? They would, yeah, but they would not have like a separate kitchen or a separate space, but yeah, having a, a roommate um, would be allowed. Okay, so it seems to me that what we're proposing here does not result in more square footage for the property than what is currently allowed if they just wanted to expand their house. It doesn't result in more lot coverage because, you know, than what they could get if they expand their house. And it doesn't result in more occupancy than what a person could get if they just rented a room in their house. So I'm I'm not seeing a lot of impacts um, to neighborhoods from allowing people to have a separate unit with a kitchen and a bathroom that still stays within the building constraints that they already have if they wanted to just expand their house. So I don't personally have, you know, a lot of, I have no objection to removing the saturation limit unless I'm not an expert on the neighborhoods around the university. So that could potentially be an exception. It sounds like staff don't currently see it as an exception. I would be open to more conversation around that. I wouldn't say that I'm going to be the driving force behind it, but my comment is I don't have a problem with eliminating the saturation limit, uh, given that the constraints remain the same around building size, what's possible to build on your lot, and occupancy limits. Lisa was next. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm somewhere similar, so I, I don't want to ignore the potential externalities, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but I've always thought this was a bit of a blunt force instrument that was trying to do something and that was just kind of sloppy. Um, sorry to whoever eventually designed it. I don't think, I hope they're not here. Sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I just, it's so weird. It's just, it's just a weird thing to think like, oh, like I want to turn my basement into a separate unit for my dad and he's getting older and needs somewhere to live, but I have to like go pay $240 to plan it. I, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Like, it's so weird. And like, oh, other people got there first and maybe they're using it. Maybe they aren't, but now you can't have one. <laughs> like, it's, it's so strange. So I am pro lifting it. I have no problem with lifting it in RL1 and RL2. However, um, I think the concerns about externalities are are meaningful and matter. Um, you know, and so I'm thinking about particularly, and I realize that this isn't such a district, I think around University Hills, interesting, potentially around Goss Grove, which I guess is around university. That there are certain areas where specifically I'm thinking of parking um, or specifically units that might be more likely. Um, and not that we can discriminate based on age, but um, might be more likely to be rented to people who might have like a greater impact within the neighborhood um, or where there's already quite an intensity of use. And when you start adding other units and maybe this is a good thing, there may be more likely to be a rental unit than to be used by a family member or, or someone else. Um, anyway, so I, I don't want to ignore the externalities. I just really am not a fan of this saturation limit policy as the tool. Um, I would be open and I actually, I'm, I'm glad that you, um, brought it up, Carl, but I would be open to like additional overlays or like specific roles for specific areas. I realize that it in some ways may increase complexity, but as long as it's a straight list of like, this is what you shall comply with, or you cannot, if I think that's much more straightforward than maybe a certain number of mysterious people around you do or don't have, I, it, it's, I, I, I really dislike it. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm not necessarily opposed to other ways of dealing with what I think the saturation limit is trying to do, um, but I, I, I don't think it was ever a good policy control mechanism and I'm all for lifting it. Um, and then we'll have more to talk about with other things, you know, that, that might 
influence how that's going to impact neighborhoods and impact uh, immediate neighbors. But yeah, it's, it's a weird tool. Thanks. Georgie. Um, I, I, I find myself agreeing with Lisa now most of the time because I, I, I tend to agree with exactly what you said. The, the, I think the only difference um, so that I can keep it shorthand is I'm, I'm opposed to lifting the um, saturation limits absent another tool to deal with the externalities that Lisa mentioned. Um, because I agree with her and with Mark for that matter, that there is a certain inequity in the way that's structured on how people get these things and that my neighbor can and I then I can't. I, I think that um, that it was probably a blunt force instrument put in place because they were trying to deal with some kind of other externalities. And um, I guess what I'm struggling with tonight is we're not given an alternative to say, okay, we recognize what's happening on University Hill and some other places. We want to, um, you know, relieve the administrative burden with the saturation limits, but where is the tool to address those concerns? Um, and so I don't want to be a roadblock on it, but at the same time, like we need some alternatives beyond just let it be a free for all. Um, especially in those, and specifically, I understand that there are lots of other things related to the code and how those things work, um, but mostly to do with neighborhoods that have got extreme externalities around that. Um, in addition, um, I, I, I'm going to voice the same concern that I had before, which is just because you remove these uh, saturation limits doesn't mean you're going to get affordable rental housing from ADUs. And so I'd also like to see that addressed in a different way. You know, maybe, maybe in a cross boulder, you remove the saturation limits, except for these areas of externality for affordable housing, uh, affordable units. Um, because we haven't, we haven't really dissected the difference between those and these presentations much. But you know, maybe it makes sense that that's another carrot for um, you know the neighborhoods across Boulder, assuming that you could actually mandate that these things get rented and that it just doesn't become a loophole for for um, for residents. Um, but those are some initial thoughts. I don't know what the mechanism. I'm hopeful that actually staff can bring forward some mechanisms that can address those things because I don't think that we as a board probably can't opine on that nearly as well as uh, what you are aware of as far as the tools that are out there. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Georgie. I just want to draw out maybe just a little bit more just so I can understand moving forward. What, when you think of externalities, which, what are the ones that we are trying to um, mitigate? Like, in your mind, and maybe for the rest of the, not just for you, Georgie, but what are the externalities? Is it parking? Is it size? What? I, I, I could put forth a few, um, and then I'm sure other people could chime in, but um, the, to echo Lisa, right, and, and, and myself, I think Uni Hill is an example where you've got wall-to-wall -wall parking, um, uh, and you've got, you've got issues around, around that. You've got issues around just general occupancy up there, and how that affects the single family neighborhood that was there and that, that partially still is there, how do we keep them intact to the extent that we can? So those are the those are the externalities that I'm focused on as it relates to those those areas specifically. I'm sure others have other things. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, and have yeah I'll, I'll add in um, two other thoughts. So uh, parking is a big one just in certain areas the parking intensity is very severe. So. I don't know that you can make it a rule that they can only rent to someone without a car or something, but that's something to think about. Um, trash, noise, I mean, all the usual things we talk about with rentals. Um, and, and to just mention, and I cannot remember what it was called, Sarah Wiebenson um, would know, I, I know she's not with the city, but she talked about the potential to do like an overlay in general for um, landlords on University Hill, um, basically requiring them to pay for a trash service or requiring them for them to pay for, you know, some kind of like 
noise management plan or something, or to pay into a fund that then specifically funded code enforcement for the Hill, you know, or something like that. Um, I don't know the legalities of that. Um, and then I just wanted to mention it because I meant to mention it earlier. I have not looked into the legality of this talk to the lawyers, but, um, but one thing that I think is really interesting up in mountain communities is that you'll have a lot of vacation rentals. There's concern that that's cutting into housing stock for people living up there, so on and so forth. Um, and one of the things I wondered about is, well, what if you put in place a rule that said every X years, three years, seven years, I don't know if it's on the sabbatical term or what, you shall rent out your property you know, to somebody for a term of no less than six, nine, 12 months, whatever, who is locally employed. And if you choose not to, that's fine. And here's how much you're going to pay. Um, you know, and, and something like that might be interesting. I, I think I'm not quite as concerned about housing as some other people are, because I also see ADUs as an equity issue. I see them as a multi-generational family issue. I see them as um, a disability issue. I see them as a childcare issue and like keeping women employed issue. Um, you know, so housing is one of the one of the outcomes I think we can get from it, but I'm not so concerned about that. I think it provides diversity of housing and allows uh, people to stay in Boulder and families to stay in Boulder who couldn't otherwise, um, you know, and maybe not to end up in a nursing home on Medicaid quite as quick. So, you know, I, I, I think there's other um, uses for them, but um, but back to externalities. I think it's just kind of the common list of things that we talk about when when we talk about over occupancy, when we talk about heavy rental intensive uh, intensivity use and so on, and the things that when they show up in a special special district like around Pearl Street, you know, we ha planning staff does a very in depth look at parking and parking impacts. You know, we look at TDM and so on, and I realize we don't need like a TDM plan for like a single little thing, but um, but those are some of the, the things that come up for me. Yeah, thanks for that. That's this is very helpful. Appreciate it. John? Yeah, thanks. Uh I I won't I agree with uh George and, and Lisa and uh and Mark on some of his comments regarding uh the desirability of ADUs, but with with respect to the saturation limit, I think. It's uh, so fundamentally unfair with respect to the race to the goal of of getting a getting one before your neighbor that I I can hardly believe that it's completely legal. But uh, uh, we have no attorney here tonight to weigh in on that, and I presume somebody's thought about that before. But I, I find it the reason it's there is because of these externalities that Lisa and, and George mentioned, and. I would like to eliminate the saturation limit, but we need to figure out how to how to deal with these externalities, and that's uh, that's my concern. But I'm, I'd be delighted to get rid of that limit because I think there'll be some litigation over that at some point. Uh, I think, for example, zoning overlays and uh, approach neighborhood approaches like that may be a a more appropriate way to deal with it. I just want to echo and support. Um, well, I, th I think I'm hearing a lot of alignment here, which is really nice. And I want to echo and support in particular something that Lisa said, um, um, uh, Lisa Smith said, Lisa Hood, could you pull back up that chart about what people say they use their ADU for, whether it's long term rental or family member or uh, in exchange for uh, child care or other services? There was like a bar chart. Yeah, let me just. I'm sorry, I have it on my other computer, so it'll take me a second. <laughs> no problem. One thing I want to say while you're pulling that up is that um, it sounds like on the survey, people were only given the opportunity to pick one. And I imagine that these things might change over time. Like somebody might rent out their unit for a few years and then have an adult child move back for a couple of years if they are in a, you know, a transition situation, or maybe their parents move in for a while as a before they um, have uh, intense medical needs, but they can live on site with a child helping as a caretaker. Maybe it's a couple that wants to have a caretaker live in their uh, ADU so that they can stay in their home for longer and, and have their caretaker have separate quarters. So, uh, you know, things might might change over time in terms of how these things are used, even within a single year or, or a period of a few years. Um, but I also, like Lisa, 
I do think these things, most of these things are housing for somebody, whether it is a, um, you know, people who lived in a large house and want to downsize as they age or as their children leave the nest, or whether it's having a family member come and stay with you, or whether it's, you know, somebody who wants to move to Boulder and they need a short term rental before they then move on to something else. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a relative. Um, all of these things might count as housing for somebody who would otherwise be taking up some other piece of housing in Boulder. So I'm, I'm not super concerned about you know, people cheating the system or finding loopholes. There will be some people who will do that. There will be some people like like George mentioned who they want to have an ADU basically as a guest house for visitors because they are wealthy enough to be able to afford that. And my perspective is people who are wealthy enough to be able to afford to have a guest house that stands empty most of the time, if they don't get a separate guest house, they'll simply do it by building a larger house that has guest quarters in it, you know. Um, so I don't think that's a strike against ADUs in general, given that ADUs still have to conform with the same building limits as we have talked about. So I guess I just wanted to reemphasize that point that I, I do think that most of these are housing units of some type. And if there are people who are using them to cheat the system, you know, they, they would probably do something similar in a different way anyway. switch back to the slides. All right, any other comments on saturation limit? Okay, we can move on to size limits. Oh, if my slides will move. Let's see. Okay, so, oh, go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry, one last comment, you know, to, talking about the externalities issue in certain neighborhoods, if we do go that route, one thought is that um, it seems like attached ADUs that take advantage of an existing floor plan are less of an issue potentially than uh, detached units if what you're concerned about is, um, you know, occupancy or having separate separate units. Um, it might not take care of parking structures because, of course, you're going to have uh, additional people in those attached units, but it might take care of some of the like single family neighborhood feel or, or if that is a concern. So it's maybe something to think about. All right. So size limits, uh, just going back to this graphic and trying to explain what our current size limits are. So for those attached units, whether that's, you know, a basement unit or attached to the house, um, Currently, it is required to be a third the size of the main house or a thousand square feet, whichever is less. So an example of that is if you have a 1500 square foot house, you're limited to a third of that. So 500 square feet for the ADU. So only a house that's over 3000 square feet would be able to take advantage of the full 1000 square feet um, for the attached unit. And then the detached unit is 550 square feet maximum for that separate structure. And this, these are for the market rate. Um, this next slide will show the difference for affordable. So um, just going back to kind of that evaluation, I thought it was interesting to see the differences between the sizes that we've got in the last couple of years. So overall average size 640, median 582, but you can see that it's different based on detached and attached because those rules are different. So the average size for a detached is 547. Again, our max is 550. Um, and then you can see it even broken down by affordable and market rate. So the affordable units that are taking advantage of going larger, the average is 634. So just under 100 square feet larger than the um, maximum. And then average market rate 492. And I did want to explain these kind of exemptions for or the the differences for affordable so a detached adu typically like i said is 550 square feet um, if you are an affordable adu it can be 800 square feet and then if you are in a historically designated property it can be a thousand square feet similarly on the right hand side the attached adus Average size is 773. There's not as much difference in the size between the affordable and market rate, the uh, 760 to 790. And then again, uh, as I mentioned, the lesser of a third or a thousand square feet is the market rate limit. And then if you're affordable or historic, it's a lesser of half or a thousand. 
Um, Georgie, it looks like you have a question. Thank you. Thank you. What I, I guess I, I'd love to know because I don't I don't know what the history is all behind this. I mean, you guys must have really good context. Yeah. So it previously for detached, um, it gets a little complicated because we didn't used to call them detached and attached, but just for simplicity's sake, detached used to be limited to 450 square feet. We increased it in 2018 to 550. Um, and it's been one third or a thousand, I think, since the 80s for attached units. Um, and in those 2018 changes, um, it had been proposed to change it to a half or a thousand for any attached unit. Um, but that was not ultimately adopted by council. So, so I guess I, I understand that. I guess the question is why? Like, why wasn't that adopted by council then? Like, what was the reason? There must have been I, a reason. <laughs> I think there, I, I wasn't here at the time, so I'm not sure, um, but I think there were concerns about the size. I don't know, Carl, if you have anything to add. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that obviously everyone has a different definition of what accessory is. So I think some of these numbers were just kind of chosen to make sure that the unit itself was accessory. Um, so I think at that time, the council you know, didn't agree that it would be accessory if it was a larger size. But I, I know that there's been some change in thinking on that, uh, given that you know we tend to be on the smaller end of what we allow in Colorado for ADUs. Um, what is around the square footage and the idea of, of growing it, what are we trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think that just adding some more flexibility, I have another slide of the way that floor area is measured for ADUs is pretty complex, and it also includes like the path of egress. So if you're trying to do an ADU above a garage, you have to include the ADU and also the path through the garage and up the stairs. So that uses up floor area that isn't really the use. Um, so it gets pretty tight at 550 for those detached units. Um, and then a lot of times the attached units are a basement unit that's an existing, um, like we talked about with the variances, it's an existing basement and they would have to do this kind of illogical wall movement to meet that thousand square foot limit or the one third or whatever. Sounds uh, like we have, a, but we have a process for that. It sounds like everyone that's asked for a variance because of that has gotten that. So that correct. doesn't seem like a reason necessarily because we've got a process that seems yeah, like I think that the, um, I mean, the initial, the initial proposal in 2018 was to increase the detached ADUs up to 800 square feet. Um, and then that was uh, brought down to 550, but given that option to 800, if you were an affordable ADU, similar to the affordable option at a half or a thousand. But for the um, attached units, one of the issues that came up is that kind of going back to those ideas of inequity, that if you have a house that is only 1500 square feet like that example you can only have 500 but then it's exponentially larger um, if your house is larger so trying to be the part of the intent at that previous time was to try to be more equitable to people with smaller houses um i, I guess I, I, one more it's sort of general, are we get are we getting it are we are you done with your pre otherwise i'll, I'll there's i think there's a, one or two more slides if i remember yeah, go, go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what those sizes are. Um, one of the other things that came up really consistently throughout all avenues of our evaluation was that the way that we measure floor area is really confusing and typically requires multiple back and forths with applicants to make sure that it's measured correctly. Um, and often because we are getting bumped up to that max limit, um, it's really important. You might think that this doesn't change anything, but it actually makes a big difference. Um, so when the last ADU changes were adopted in 2018, there was a specific floor area measurement just for ADUs that was adopted into the code. And my understanding of the intent was trying to be flexible for certain types of construction like straw bale houses. Um, so there's this unique quirk that ADUs are measured to six inches from the exterior wall. 
um, where we don't do that for any other building in the city. And so it gets really confusing about where I'm measuring to. And when you're at these kind of smaller end square footages, it makes a big difference whether you're, draw you're drawing the line on the interior wall, six inches outside of that wall or on the exterior wall. So the more that we can have the code be consistent for all of the buildings and not like a, a different kind of measurement for ADUs, the faster and more efficient the process is for everybody. Um, and again, I already talked about the, the egress issue that this example is a ADU unit exactly 550 square feet at the limit, um, but they have to include that stairway up. Um, so that takes away from the size of the actual unit, but technically counts as floor area. So this is something that we wanted to, even if we do not change the size limits, we want to clarify this floor area measurement with these changes because it is such a common issue that comes up with our applicants um, and making sure that that's consistent with the way we do it in the rest of the city. But on the discussion on how you account for floor area, would that stairway and that landing be accounted for if it was in a single family home? Yeah, so well, so that would be the same. If we were to have that measured the same, it would be, yes. Yeah, so it's a difference. That's why it's included in the ADA floor area because it's it would be, it's part of the envelope, right? Right, the floor area. Okay, yeah. All right. thank you. So those are the, um, I, I realize, I think Sarah already brought this up. We, we're not proposing a specific limit. Um, the, I mean, the idea from the previous code changes were 800 square feet for detached units and then going up to a, a half or a thousand. So those would potentially, and those are very much in line with the comparable cities that we looked at. So that would be kind of an initial idea of what the increase would be. But um, we are curious to hear your thoughts on increasing the size limit, changing that area or the way that we measure floor area um, or whether just keep the size limits as is, um, just really open to any comments. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, I think this is fascinating. Um, <laughs> My overall take, and I'll get more fine-grained in a moment, is, is that it's so specific to each unit, and that makes it sort of hard to make useful rules overall. Um, I definitely think clarifying floor area measurements would be good, you know, just making it more transparent, making sure people understand how it works. I think in many cases, I would be open to increasing the allowable size of ADUs, but I can think of other use cases where I wouldn't. You know, I, I think about Georgie's example of, you know, a, a full scrape and then a very large home being built. And then, you know, if it's calculated as a percentage of the total square footage of that house, you basically end up with like two houses on one lot where it's almost a subdivision, you know, or similarly, if you increase the, the sizing too much and it's a very small house, you almost end up with a duplex situation. And I'm not necessarily opposed in certain circumstances to subdivision or duplex, but I don't think that's what we're trying to do with ADUs, you know, so I, I think we want to be careful about Kind of how that works. At the same time, I remember this was years ago, but I toured a bunch of um, remodels in Martin Acres, and and some of those folks had put in ADUs, and some of those ADUs were so microscopic as to be nearly useless, you know. And and I think they would have been happy to have carved out a bit more square footage to make it so that it was actually large enough, you know, for a couple to be in instead of a single person, you know, or or large enough to be used. And and um. I realize we're kind of spoiled with space. We live out in the West, you know, anyone who's ever tried to rent an apartment in New York City or London or somewhere else is probably laughing at us right now. But but I also just want to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, if you're trying to, for example, get an accessible, you know, wheelchair accessible roll-in shower into a space and also a kitchen that someone can move around in and so on and so forth. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why people look to ADUs. The square footage can really constrain that. So um, I, I think I am open to increasing the allowable size of ADUs, but I would want to do it in a really thoughtful way and be thinking about how that's going to impact, you know, specific areas. And like, for example, I'm not super troubled um, by the basements that were converted that got a little extra square footage so they didn't have to put a random wall in. You know, that's within an existing house footprint. I, you know, there may be other externalities that happen from if that is a rental or whoever's living in it, but I, I think that seems fine. Um, we have a lot of existing code and regulation that 
to my understanding, would control things like setbacks and view sheds and solar, um, you know, and so on. And so to some extent that's controlled for, but um, yeah, I, I think I'm open to increasing allowable sides of ADUs. And I think the use case really matters. And again, I wonder if this gets back to an overlay, you know, if we're trying to keep whatever we mean by a single family personality in, a, in an area, if that's something we care about, you know, does that mean that if you're gonna have over this amount of square footage, it has to be attached, you know, in part of the overall footprint and you can't, you know, build an outbuilding um, or that it has to be over the garage or something, I don't know. Um, I'm okay with it. I think it has to be done very carefully and it's gonna really vary depending on the location. Um, but also some of the limits that we currently have means that you build very, very expensive separate properties with separate metering and separate everything. And, and then they're like these little DPD efficiency apartments that you can kind of like scooch around. And I was shocked by how tiny some of them are um, once you meet all the code requirements. So I want us to be aware of that and maybe tour some, that'd be fun. Thank you. Sarah. Um, I have a question. What is the rationale for increasing the size? Because in the material, there's sort of this implication that increased size will produce more ADUs or something. And I don't really understand where that calculation comes from. That seemed to be an assumption made. So I'm still, I don't quite understand. I understand the need to address the, the floor area um, calculations. And I, I'm not going to try to figure out what those are. That's what you guys do, your, your area of expertise. But I don't understand really the argument that or what what's the what are you trying to accomplish by may, by proposing larger ADUs? Yeah, so I think that just looking through that um, evaluation report, that was the the change that seemed to have the biggest impact, or the most number of ADUs would not have complied prior to it. And so I think that the larger that's allowed, you might open it up to different types of people that want to live there. Perhaps if it was 800 square feet, there could even be a family there. But right now, um, at 550 square feet, that's pretty tight. So I think it's trying to diversify the number or the type of people that might be willing or want to live in an ADU um, by increasing that size. And we did see that increasing the size just 100 square feet, um, people did build larger. But your but you're, you're, you're caught, you're, you're assuming causation. Um, it is also equally possible that the reason there was a spike in the number of ADUs built was because the opportunity to build more ADUs became something more homeowners understood, right? I mean, it's you're you're making a huge assumption that that extra hundred feet, um, hundred square feet, is what led seventy two to an additional seventy two ADUs, um, and I, I think that that's a. I, I just I I'm not saying I they should not get bigger or should get bigger. I don't really particularly have an opinion, except in so far as it impacts the benefit of permanently affordable units being bigger. Um, but I just think you're making a huge leap in your assumptions about what the size, the increased size of ADUs is resulted in. I think we're also responding to just some feedback that we've gotten from the community that uh, some folks have indicated that we might get more ADUs if we allowed a larger size and that they were supportive of that. So I thought it's something that we're exploring. Well, I, you know, lots of people want bigger, <laughs> you know, it's just, I, you know, I, and I know the ship has sailed on the uh, uh, eliminating the saturation limits, but I go back to, and I'm, I don't happen to agree with Laura on the point she made. Our goal here is affordable housing. That is our goal. And if we do not have this, this, the mechanisms in place to ensure that what we are actually getting from this is affordable housing, preferably permanently affordable housing, I just have a, I have a problem with us trying to figure all this stuff out before we have resolved some of these issues of things being built that are not being used for the purpose that we wanted them to be used for. And I, I will leave it at that. Yeah, thanks for those points, Sarah. I 
the city council objective is to increase the number of ADUs in the community. So um, the increase in the size limit increase the number we I mean it could be debated the causation correlation thing but the increase in size did lead or those changes among other changes led to a significant number of increased ADUs so that's why we think that if there was a, another increase perhaps we'd get more ADUs perhaps you would perhaps you wouldn't you don't know and this city council's wanting more ADUs is not to have more to ADUs it's that is not their goal they're the 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 new majority wants more housing that is their goal adus are a tool to get more housing so the the you we could have a million more adus but if 900,000 of those are used for party purposes you know so anyways i just i, I just think we need to make sure that what goes into the ordinance does the most that it possibly can to produce housing that is used for housing that is affordable. And I, that, that's what I think is missing. We're so focused on the form that we were, I think we're kind of skating over the, the other issue. So, so. Thanks. Laura. Um, so, so I will say that I have lived in ADUs. That was my preferred form of housing from the time I graduated from college all through grad school, uh, probably until I was about 30. Um, and I have lived in ADUs that were 500 square feet, and I have lived in ADUs that were, um, well, I haven't lived in an ADU that was 800 square feet, but I lived in a condo that was 850 square feet. So I know what it's like to live in those sizes. Um, and those sizes are like 500 square feet is good for a single person tight for a couple next to impossible for a family maybe in japan or something people will put up with that but most americans won't um and 850 square feet was tight for my husband and i and a dog so i'll, I'll just say that you know these are not going to be the most sought after high rent properties in boulder they're going to be modest compared to most housing in boulder um and smaller sizes, people are not going to be willing to pay the same that they would for a larger unit. So they will, by nature, even at market rate, be relatively affordable. I know that we want to increase permanently affordable housing, and I think that the incentives that are in this program help to do that, and I'm very supportive of that incentive to have more um, affordable rentals. I do think that maybe more needs to be done that if you get the the uh, bonus area, the bonuses on um, parking for an affordable rental that you need to actually rent it out <laughs> rather than simply move into it um, because that's the purpose of having that program. So maybe we need to tighten up that program a little bit, but I'm not opposed to having market rate ADUs. Um, I think that having more of them will by nature increase the stock of the diversity of housing in Boulder and the types of people that will take advantage of that housing in Boulder. So um, I'm, I don't have quite the same level of concern about that. Um, I do think that increasing the allowable size of ADUs uh, is a good thing. You know, um, I got a personal communication from someone who said that they built a 442 square foot affordable ADU and it cost them $380,000, right? If you're gonna put that kind of money into improving your property, most people are gonna want more than 442 two square feet. Um, you can rent it for more, you know, and it has more potential uses, more people can live there. So if I, I also think it's a great thing that we might have ADUs that families could actually take advantage of, maybe new families, they've got an infant or something, and they don't need, you know, three rooms for three children, but a family could live there. And that's possible in 800 square feet. That's dang hard in 500 square feet. Um, so I am supportive of increasing the allowable size of ADUs uh, to be more in line with what other communities have done. Um, and I have no problem with staff's proposal about the changes to how floor area is measured to be more in line with other construction and building standards. Go ahead. Um, so um, I, I, I kind of fall where where Lisa was at, where I, 
I'm not necessarily based on the context that was given by staff I'm not necessarily locked into the existing square footage that exists currently with our ADUs because no one can explain why it's there exactly except the fact that these things should be accessory units and not a duplex in disguise if we want a duplex we should be we should be doing zoning for duplex which is a separate conversation but the conversation ADUs should be an accessory unit. Um, I don't know that changing the size on the attached beyond a thousand makes sense um, because uh, I don't think we need to because we've we've proven that when those variances have been applied for for good reason, um, they've been given in every single circumstance that's been presented to the city. So to me, that makes sense to maintain um, because I think beyond a thousand feet, you start getting outside of an accessory use for a dwelling. Um, as far as uh, a detached owner accessory unit, I don't know that 800 square feet is 800 square feet feels just as arbitrary as 550 square feet. I think um, Lisa Hood uh, brought up an interesting point around how these things are calculated relative to if they're sitting above a two car garage, um, that the square footage can get very tight and the building can get very tight, especially accommodating for the, um, the circulation that you have to on in addition to the interior square footage. And so I'm not opposed to raising it. I just think it should be done carefully so that we're not excessive because I do think that every square foot that you add to these things is one more um, square foot that can be charged for and therefore will ultimately um, be a higher rate to the person that's renting it. And so if we're trying to create something that's market rate affordable, I would look to um, what the size constraints need to be to accommodate a unit um, like that above a two car garage or something to that effect or whatever examples you might have and come up with the right square footage rather than something that might feel maybe a little arbitrary. Um, and then I would ask, you, you mentioned in, in, um, and you showed that graphic around how square footage is calculated and it's from the midpoint of the wall. I guess that goes back to sort of uh, Laura and my understanding that FAR is calculated for a, a home and ADU the exact same way. So I guess that's more of a question, just making sure whatever, whatever philosophy we come up with measurement, that those measurements are identical, whether that was considered a single home or uh, an ADU plus a home. And it doesn't sound exactly like that based on what you said, unless I'm missing something, how it's measured from the, from the midpoint of the wall. Yeah, it actually gets even more confusing as I try to explain it. Um, so the overall F floor area that's allowed on the lot would use that external line. Okay. So that would be the same. But when we're measuring the maximum floor area of the ADU, that's where it can vary based on whether it's the six inch out or the full external. So you're That's measuring it almost like uh, how a landlord would measure like an apartment building, like you have like units adjacent to each other rather than something that's fully detached. From a right. Square, or square yeah, page. they're they're measured differently, but overall the maximum floor area for the overall site is the same. It. Um, it's just the other. Yeah, I, about think, I mean, I think that's just an opportunity, right, to measure things the same way for everybody, because I just think that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so, um, yeah. I'll leave my comments to that. Thank you. Great, Appreciate thanks. That. John. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just say uh, George's points uh, make a lot of sense to me, and I agree with them. And I also agree that there should be a consistent way of uh, doing the floor area measurement. Uh, uh, I don't see why it has to be so much different and confusing. Uh, with respect to increasing the allowable size, I'm, I think it would be, I'm open to it, but it needs to be justified. And I think, for example, taking, uh, taking the area above a two, two car garage as a standard, that, that's a, there's a certain logic to that that makes sense beyond uh, having an, 
just a number that seems very arbitrary. So I would support that. Okay. Thanks, that's helpful. Laura? Does staff have a measurement of how many square feet is the typical two, two um, car garage? Because I feel like that's quite small. <laughs> that might be less than 550 square feet. It's like 400 something. Let me run a quick yeah, it's note. typically 400 square feet, 20 by 20. Yeah, so I would not recommend going back to <laughs> we limit it to the size of a two car garage. <laughs> but well, I, I understand wanting to have some logic to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I have lived above a garage. It was quite small. <laughs> well, including the stairs and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway. Yeah, no, I so, understand. I understand the point to have a logic to what their number, came, where the number came from. Thanks. Anything else on this? Okay, let's keep moving. All right, now the fun, the fun stuff. Very specific code clarification. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to go through, just give a few sentences on each one of these related to code clarification and process improvements. These are also explained in the memo. Um, these ones we're hoping more for if there are any initial red flags. These are really for clarification of issues that came out through that um, evaluation. But if there's anything that sounds like a red flag to you, um, or if we need to discuss further, let me know. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Could you please explain both for our benefit and for the members of the public who might still be with us, what exactly is meant by flexibility for height of existing structures? Yeah, sorry, I'm going to explain each one, but that's ah, what I was okay. trying to say, but if there's anything as I'm explaining it, or once I get through it or whatever, um, that sounds like a red flag or you want to discuss it, um, I can add more, but I'll just give a few gotcha. sentences on Thank each. Thank you. Okay, so the first one is extending the approval expiration period. So right now you have to establish the ADU within one year. Most of our land use reviews have to be established within three years, but because the ADU is a conditional use, it falls under that, which is a one-year um, establishment. We're finding, especially in the last couple of years, that it's really difficult for people to get permits within that time, obtain a contractor within that time, build the building within that time. So we're often extending that expiration period. Um, and it's also something that just provides a lot of stress for the applicants um, and what people will withdraw their application um, just knowing that they can't meet that per ex expiration period. So um, that's something that we could easily add some flexibility and maybe align with some of our other land uses that are allowed three years to establish. Um, but it is just something that the nature of construction these days is really difficult to get done within one year. Uh, next is the flexibility for exist height of existing structures. So right now, all accessory structures have to be there. The height limit is 20 feet, but there is a little bit of flexibility in the code for ADUs to go up to 25 feet. But there, if you are beyond for an existing structure, if you are beyond 25 feet, there is no option. This speaks to what one of our commenters talked about. There is no avenue for flexibility beyond that. So if your existing building is 26 feet, there is no way to convert that building um, to an ADU. So actually another commenter talked about digging the hole to make it meet that height. So um, because we think that adapting existing structures and the adaptive reuse of historic materials is beneficial to the city, um, likely has a less impact on the neighbor because it's an existing structure. Uh, we think that there should be a flexibility flexibility mechanism for people, whether that's obtaining a variance through BOZA or whether that's just a staff level modification um, based on it being an existing structure. Just to be clear, this is only for existing structures, so it wouldn't be additional height for a new structure. It's just if it's already existing, kind of those situations that were brought up in the public comment, but just providing that avenue. Did that answer that, Laura? Did that clarify? <laughs> Yes, thank you. So you're okay. saying this is only if you're converting a building that already exists, converting part of it to an ADU. So you're making your attic into an ADU, for example, and it happens to be above 25 feet. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, the lockable separation, this one was interesting because it came up in several of the reasons why people withdrew their application. Um, it's just a part of the code that's 
uh, deep within the code and not in the ADU section, where the definition of dwelling unit means that it has to be separated by a lock. Um, and people don't know that. And for some reason, people don't want to do that sometimes. Uh, but just clarifying that within the ADU regulations instead of within like three steps of looking at definitions. Um, so that wouldn't be a substantive change. It would just be making it easier for people to find that requirement. Um, limited accessory units. So I actually didn't even touch on these, but we have detached ADUs, attached ADUs, and then limited accessory units. Um, we only have one, a single limited accessory unit. It's another avenue for a non-conforming duplex, essentially. Um, so that it adds several paragraphs of text and complication to have this separate unit that are the separate type of unit that really doesn't have much utility in the city. And that one property has other avenues um, that we could work with them and then clean up that part of the code. So um, it would ha wouldn't have much of an impact. Um, it's kind of a leftover from previous codes. And then I think Sarah, you had brought up the owner occupancy question earlier related to LLCs. Um, that's something that came up throughout the evaluation about needing clarity about whether LLCs, because we require a property owner to live on site, whether an LLC can have an ADU and how they would prove that a owner of that LLC is living on site. So the, the code just doesn't, is silent on that. And so it's something that um, we need to clarify um, and then we'll also be asking city council policy direction about whether LLCs um, should own ADUs um, because they are able, an LLC is able to own a rental. Um, so uh, it's just kind of a gray area uh, there that we would need to fix in the code. And also temporary rental exemptions. This gets really into the nitty gritty, but um, an owner can actually um, live temporarily outside of Boulder County for up to 12 months and not have to get a rental license um, to rent out their property while they're gone. And so there's just not a lot of clarity about whether that property is allowed to have an ADU at the same time. So kind of similar, just adding clarity for how that owner occupancy should work. And then finally, the public notice requirement. So ADUs are one of the only administrative applications that require public notice of the adjacent neighbors. Um, the only other one that we have is solar access, and it really adds several procedural steps to um, the ADU approval process, but unfortunately, the um, oftentimes neighbors will reach out because they've gotten this notice, but there's no public hearing or anything that they can give their comment on, um, so it's kind of questionable about whether there's value for that public notice or whether that's necessary, so that's something else that we wanted to clarify um, and potentially it would be in lieu, in the in the spirit of improving the process and um, making things more efficient, not having that public notice would uh, take numerous steps in time off of an ADU application. So those are the code clarification items. Are there any that raise red flags or we want to talk about more? John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think several of these are are good. Uh, I mean, the uh, approval expiration period and uh, flexibility of height for existing structures and lockable separation. I I defer to staff's uh, thoughts on that. Um, with respect to owner occupancy and the public notice requirement. I, I regard those as, as fundamental to the whole concept of what we're dealing with. And I would, uh, I think public, the public notice requirement, I think anything that lets the neighbors be informed about what's happening next door, I think is to be desired. And I, I would resist elimination of that. And the owner occupancy, I think is, uh, a very important element as well. Uh, and, you know, I understand a lot of homes are owned through LLCs and so on. Um, but uh, I think, uh, I think owner occupancy is so important that I would be reluctant to make any changes to that until I see something that is clearly uh, an improvement. 
Yeah, thanks for that, John. And just to clarify, it's, it wouldn't be changing the requirement for owner occupancy. There would still be a requirement for owner occupancy. It's just clarifying some of these questions that have come up about whether you know, owning an LLC and living there counts and or this temporary rental exemption. So the owner occupancy is not on the table for changing. It's just adding that clarity for those particular situations that have been coming up. Thanks. Laura. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with John that the owner occupancy is key for ADUs. Um, I, I know in conversations with ML, she feels that that way as well and would be supportive. Um, I think that I think I understand what you mean by these clarifications that for an LLC, they would have to show that somebody who is an owner of the LLC permanently resides on site, right? So for example, my neighbors uh, own their house through a, a company that they own, but it is it is a family that lives there um, and they are the pr proprietors of that LLC that owns the house. So it sounds like it's just clarifying how that works that there would be a pathway to prove that you are a real person that actually lives there and not a corporation that just rents it out and is an investor. Um, so I'm okay with that. And the temporary rental exemption, I think I understand what you're saying. My husband and I looked into this uh, because our house does not meet code. We cannot get a rental license without making significant in improvements in the um, uh, insulation and um, energy efficiency from our 1974 house, but we could do a sabbatical where we leave our house for a year and rent it out without having a city of Boulder rental license. And it sounds like you're just clarifying that if the owner who lives in the house leaves for a year, they don't have to kick out their tenant that's in their ADU, that they, if they take their sabbatical intending to return to their home, they can keep their ADU going while they're on sabbatical. Is that what you're saying? Yep, correct. Okay, exactly. thank you. Yeah, um, I think I think I'm in support of all of these, except that I agree. To me, if if there's no meaningful way for people to plug in after receiving a public notice requirement, then that means maybe we need a way for them to be heard. I, I appreciate that it's sort of like, well, why are we telling you if we're not going to do anything with how you respond? Um, you know, but but they might raise something you don't know. Um, you know, so I I don't know. I mean, this is creating probably just creating work for staff. But to me, I'm like, okay, then create a Google form. You know, scan this QR code, go here, tell us how you feel. We'll look at it when we review this whole thing. Um, you know, I, I would provide a way to provide public comment if I'm going to provide public notice. Um, and and I agree that even just people knowing, like, hey, like that's what that construction project is. Oh, like, why are you building that? Like, what's going on? You know. Who's my new neighbor? You know, those are things that build community, in my opinion. Um, and then also, yeah, the temporary rental exemption makes total sense to me. I, I have friends. One is a CU professor. One is a science teacher at Centaurus. They live in East Boulder. They don't have an ADU, um, but they traveled for four to six months, I think, um, on sabbatical and enrolled their children in school in France. It was very adorable. Um, you know, and if they had had an ADU, it sure would have been nice to know that, okay, our, our ADU tenants can stay, you know, we're going to rent to this other family who's having a major renovation done on their house in our own neighborhood. Um, and we don't have to kick those people out just because we happen to be doing this cool abroad thing. Um, you know, I, I think you'd want to make sure that it wasn't getting abused. That's always the concern, whether it's the LLCs or the temporary rental, but, um, yeah, some of those things that we bump into with rental restrictions can get kind of silly and actually cause more turnover and and I don't think are good for the community. Um, and yeah, and the rest of it seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, so, yeah. Um, you can just mark me down for what Lisa said. I thought that was perfect and encapsulated my thoughts. Thanks. Any other thoughts? Oh, Lisa, is that an old hand? All right. Okay. Well, that was really helpful. There's just one more slide um, related to process changes. So this was also a big thing that came out of the evaluation was trying to understand the process changes. These wouldn't be things that you would see in the ordinance, but I just wanted to make you aware of the changes that we're looking to make as well. Um, so process improvements includes a one-step review right now. It's a two-step review. You get your ADU approved and then you have to go through the building permit. And that just causes a lot of confusion confusion because um, people think once they've gotten the ADU approved, that means that 
they can build it exactly how they got it approved, but it hasn't gone through a full building permit review. And often there are hangups related to that, um, like Laura mentioned, meeting code um, that we haven't done through that ADU approval. So the idea is to try to combine those approvals so they're happening at the same time so that people, it's kind of one and done, you get the ADU and the building permit at the same time. Um, that will also create a lot more efficiency just in review times and by having multiple reviewers look at it at once. Um, and these are things, you know, looking at the numbers of ADUs, we didn't have so many um, back, you know, 10 years ago. And so this wasn't maybe as big of an issue. But now that we have um, more of these coming in each year, it just exacerbates the issue of review times and things like that. Um, addressing, this one's kind of silly, but when the ADU is approved, we send out a notice that the ADU has to be split into two different addresses, unit A and unit B. It's caused a lot of problems with people that don't end up doing the ADU, and then they their property is split into unit A and unit B, and it's really hard for them to undo. So um, that's one just changing. To, that's a simple change of making that address announcement happen once they actually get their building permit. Um, declarations of use. So when you get an ADU approved, you have to sign a declaration of use and record it with the property. And um, just as we change codes over time, it um, they can become out of date. So we just need to talk with our legal team about how to best update that and the process to use with that. And then the last one um, is just improving our website and self-service handouts. Um, like I mentioned, there were over 200 questions about ADUs, and I think there's a lot of improvements that could be made in terms, as I've been looking at all of these other cities that have ADUs uh, that can explain our regulations, especially once we have, um, if we've made some of these changes that improve the clarity and simplicity of the regulations, we'll be able to make some good handouts and maybe some ex explanatory videos that could help people through the process um, and try to improve that for people as well. So, yeah, John. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, just wanted to ask, uh, how do ADUs deal with uh, utilities and uh, metering uh, and uh, tap connections and so on? That is something that our building permit folks would have a lot more knowledge than I would. I don't know if Carl and Charles maybe know. That's one avenue I haven't looked deeply into. I think they do have to get a separate meter if, if they I'm do. Not. Yeah, that's correct. I remember looking into it. I can't remember why something was planning. I don't know, but um, separate, which is one of the reasons it's so expensive. So both separate water meter and uh, for the city and so on, and uh, also uh, for the uh, for XL power and gas. Uh -huh. That's what I remember. I staff can maybe confirm, but I recall it was pretty intense. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Heard. Yeah, sorry I didn't go to that actual question page. Are there any comments on the simplification and clarification or process improvement? Was it John or Laura next? Go ahead, Laura. Um, I don't have any comments on the proposed uh, uh, clarifications to the process. I do have a couple of other questions um, mm -hmm. when we get to that part of the agenda, if nobody else has questions or comments about the process clarifications. Looks like we can go ahead. Okay. First of all, I just want to clarify. I, I uh, simplified too much when I said my house does not meet code in case anybody is concerned about like, why is she living in a house that doesn't meet code? It totally meets code for a resident to an owner to live in it. If I were to apply for a rental license for the city of Boulder, there are higher energy efficiency standards. That's the code that it doesn't meet is the energy efficiency standards. If I were to renovate or rent out, we'd have to upgrade that. I just want to clarify that in case anybody is concerned about me living in a non-code compliant house. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about the community connectors in residence meeting that you had, and, and maybe these results have not yet been summarized, but our community connectors in residence for folks who aren't aware maybe anybody who's attending, um, are the most plugged in to our low income communities, our communities that are disadvantaged, where people speak for their first language is something other than English. And so I would be very interested to know what kind of input you got from the community connectors and residents about their thoughts on these ADU changes. 
Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to bring that up. So we met with them on Friday. So unfortunately, it was after your packet went out. So we weren't able to include the notes um, from that discussion, but it was great. Um, they were overall very supportive of uh, the increase to size limits and the elimination of the saturation limit. And then they had some really great ideas for, for some additional programs and things that we could look into um, related to like uh, opening it up for Section 8 vouchers um, to be used for ADUs, like making sure, and these are things we need to discuss with our housing folks as well, but um, just trying to make sure that there are as many opportunities as possible for people to be able to actually rent those ADUs. Um, looking through my notes to remember everything because I don't want to miss anything. Um, uh, similar concerns about making sure that these are actually used for housing and not just um, uh, guest houses or things like that. So similar to what you all have been saying. Um, and then also they had some great ideas for programs that could assist homeowners in building ADUs, acknowledging the expansive costs or expensive costs of ADUs. So if there was some kind of program for first time homeowners or something that would help them to be able to create that revenue source for them. Um, so those are kind of the things that we focused on in the community connectors discussion. Thank you. And could I ask you to elaborate on one of your points, if you could, because it was a little bit controversial here about appropriate size limits. And you said that there was support for going a little bit bigger. Any background or rationale for why the community connectors might have felt that way? Um, they actually brought up the, the fact that you could have a family in a larger unit. So that's what the um, community connectors were talking about. Thank you. To size. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I have one question. One of one of the people attending here tonight mentioned uh, PUDs and uh, how how they are prevented from participating in the in this game altogether. And I wondered if you had any response to his comments. I see Charles um, unmuting himself, so I'm going to go to Charles. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate the, the question, uh, John. It's been an age-old conundrum in Boulder, um, and being part of a PUD certainly doesn't preclude you from being able to do an ADU. There's just additional levels of uh, standards that you need to adhere to. Um, and I think the way that some of the approvals were crafted, depending on the vintage of the PUD, um, might not be our finest hour as regulators. So sometimes those PUDs require a little bit more interpretation, but it doesn't make things impossible. That said, um, Council has recognized um, the fact that we regulate PUDs really consistently across the city as a pretty significant issue and a pretty significant kind of barrier to the administration of our regulations, um, particularly uh, when it comes to self-service for some of our customers, um, that they've allocated some resources for us to actually hire a planner to start rifling through some of these PUDs. And um, some are much worse than others. And I think we've identified those to try to figure out a way to either rezone them or amend the standards so that the PUDs are easier to administer over time um, and have, uh, you know, underlying regulations that um, are intuitive, but support the original um, approval intent of the PUD. So um, we did a, a job description and that was advertised at the end of last year. So uh, we should be making a hire to help support that effort um, early this year. Okay, thank you. You bet. Very interesting. I have one last comment on my list, and that is, you know, uh, the scope of this project. And my understanding is that council intentionally narrowed the scope um, to try to get something done quickly. Um, you know, because this is the kind of issue that can kick around for, for many years and be quite controversial if certain elements are included. And so I think the idea was to pare it down to things that would be relatively easy to do on a fairly quick timeline, given a lot of the input that we've already had on a certain subset of issues. I completely support that. 
And I think that, that you know, the changes that staff have scoped here, um, you know, we've, we've given our input on that. Um, but a lot of the input has focused on sort of um, pulling back from this kind of narrow scope. And I, I want to raise the issue of expansion because, you know, we saw from the um, public comments from the 2016 to 2018 uh, public outreach effort that th there is a, a very strong ambivalence in Boulder. There are a lot of people who um, have strong concerns about ADUs, and there are also a lot of people, an equal number and potentially greater. I think it actually, the majority fell down on the side of um, wanting more expansion of this and more ambition in, in how we make ADUs more possible. And so a lot of that more ambitious scope was carved out and eliminated for this phase. And I just want to give my support, and I think there may be other planning board members who would also support returning in the near future um, to those elements that were carved out that might be a little bit more ambitious. I don't want those to, to fall off the map, um, although I'm delighted to see this more limited scope moving forward and, and let's get it done, but let's not forget about some of these other elements that we should we should keep exploring and not say we've closed the door on them. I don't think that we have closed the door. I think we have simply said let's get a smaller scope done and then return to them later, and I want to give my support to that. Thank you. Yeah, that is what council also said that to keep a list of ideas for future changes to the ADUs, but focus on these ones for now. Thank you. I very much support incremental change and uh, data driven analysis and let's see what what these changes do and then maybe see if we need to go farther. I think this is a good, uh, a good step. Thanks. Georgie. Yeah, I, I, um, I know you took notes on this, but Laura mentioned data-driven analysis, and I think that's important um, relative to the transactional values of the homes that have ADUs on them, what these things are actually worth, how, how they're being utilized on a go-forward basis. Um, because I, I do, I, I think, a little bit absent from this conversation is the idea that um, if you've got you know smaller single family homes uh, and that, and they have more of an opportunity to build onto their homes to add ADUs and those ultimately get sold, um, are we creating less affordable housing stock going forward? Um, and uh, so I, I think what we don't have in any of this analysis is sort of you know how, how these things are, are you know the, the the value of of what's being created here and how things are transacting and flowing through our our system um so um, i appreciate you taking that back and um getting us some more information at some point in time on that especially if when this comes up again uh, as it inevitably will um i think that will be important along with the idea of you know, what tools we have to create more rental housing inventory. Um, because I, I hear a lot of advocacy in town for ADUs for because to, to, to Laura's point around the community connectors. Um, but I wonder, you know, if someone builds a, a thousand square foot detached ADU or is anyone from the community connectors actually going to be able to afford it? Um, and so it's a, it's it's one thing to ask them the question and to get the answer. Oh, we would love a we'd love relaxation of of uh, bigger sizes because that sounds really nice. But the question is, um, number one, would it ever be put into rental inventory? And number two, even if it did, would it be something that someone could actually afford in the group that we're speaking to that's advocating for it, um, or are they getting boxed out? Um, and those are the nuances that. While I appreciate the conversations with community connectors, I think we have to have dollars and cents conversations too um, to really understand if these things are pragmatic or um, solving something else than maybe what they're looking for and actually maybe exacerbating a problem. Thanks. That's right. Yeah, uh, just to embroider a little bit on on what Georgia just was saying, that was that was my concern also with, and that's why I suggested being in contact with appraisers and uh, property developers and so on about 
what we're actually doing because my concern is that we may be eliminating some of the missing middle type housing that the little bit that remains in Boulder by by doing some of these projects and and it we just want to be conscious of of whether we are causing some unintended consequences but i think i think the point is made thanks I just want to throw in on this conversation. I, I think it's really important, and George makes a good point that if somebody, uh, I'm going to go beyond what George said and, and use the example that he gave. If somebody who's in a $5.6 million house or whatever that number was builds a thousand square foot luxury ADU, it's probably not going to be affordable to anybody uh, of modest means in Boulder. Th that's absolutely true. And I don't think anybody's trying to pretend that it's not. And John makes a good point that some of these small single family homes, absolutely, when you add an ADU to the property, you're going to increase the resale value of that property. But then on the flip side, have you now um, increased the chances that that home will stay standing and not be scraped the next time it is sold, scraped and turned into a 7,000 square foot single family home, right? So um, these are just very, very complicated questions that I don't think it's fair to expect that staff are gonna come back with all the answers. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about it. Um, I, I don't know what the answers are, right? But it, it, it does seem to me that if you have a modest sized, um, uh, ADU, it is much more likely to serve as housing for a person of modest means than almost any other housing in Boulder. Um, and maybe we can get some numbers about the average rental price for an ADU versus uh, condos in a condo building versus single family home rentals. I imagine that those ADUs are going to come out looking pretty good across the board on average, but I don't know that. Um, and so I do agree with George that data is important and we should keep these conversations going. Uh, you know, point counterpoint, we, we, we need to keep talking about it because we all want the same thing. And it's just very, very hard to do here in Boulder is to provide affordable housing stock. Um, and I think ADUs are part of that puzzle just based on my own personal experience with the rental market, both as a renter and as a landlord. Uh, in the past, I'm not currently a landlord, but have been. Um, but, but let's keep talking. Okay, Lisa, have you gotten what you wanted? Absolutely. And more. <laughs> Thank you. No, really, it was a really great discussion and conversation. And I think there's a lot of additional work that can be done um, related to all of your points. And I think you brought up a lot of really great things that we'll look into. And um, we will come back and continue the conversation with the community over the next month or so, go to those other boards and city council, take all of that input as well, and then hopefully be back with an ordinance in the next couple of months. Okay, thank you. Great Thanks. feedback, Lisa. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very thank helpful you. feedback. Thanks for the consideration tonight. Okay. All right. With that, uh, I think we can move to matters. Um, any matters from staff tonight? Um, nothing for me, but I would invite Brad. No, I think uh, there's been a lot of good discussion tonight, and it's, it's hard to top that. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions, though, that um, any board members have. Okay, well, board members. <laughs> All right. And, oh, Laura, go ahead. I have one. At the last Landmarks board meeting, it came up that board members are being offered uh, an equity and inclusion training. Um, and I assume that that's gonna be offered for planning board as well. And um, it, just curious if there's anything about that or, or when we will be hearing about that. Uh, I do know that we are doing that for our staff that facilitates boards. I am a little less clear on that for board members themselves. I do vaguely remember that discussion, so I'm sure you're quite right about that, Laura, and we'll we'll look into that. Uh, Devin, maybe you can flag that for a discussion with you and me. Unless, Charles, you know something more. That I, I believe we are offering a training for our um, elected and appointed officials, although I don't know what the, the schedule is, so maybe we could look okay. into that. Yeah. 
so for Landmarks Board, um, uh, Brenda Rittenauer, I think, was the person who went over it, and there basically were like three options. It's like you can get a training for your board at one of your regularly scheduled meetings or a special meeting, or you can like join with another board at a specially scheduled meeting, or you could join a training for staff. And she was looking for input on whether Landmarks Board wanted to get a training as a board or if they wanted to do it individually, and there was a whole conversation about it. So yep, I'm assuming we'll, we'll have a conversation at some point. Yeah, and as you laid that out, I those details so we will we will get that in front of you either by email or at a future meeting and uh, I, I do know none of the, to the best of my understanding none of that scheduling's happened yet so we'll we'll get we'll get cycled in on that thanks for flagging that for us great thank you um and then it may be that no one well i don't want to say no one but I'm, I'm not sure if folks know the answer to this but is this a different diversity and equity training than the one that we did what was that a year ago year and a half ago is it like a, a just for board members who've been on longer? I think we did a couple different um, DI trainings, which are always good to do. But I just wondering what the difference might be. Yeah, that that I don't know. So we'll check on the history on that. Okay. Any other matters from board? All right. I think it's time to go home. Uh, have, have a great night. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's adjourn the meeting. Thanks to everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, all.